You know what I was immediately in my head just now is I was just going like, hi on a YouTube channel, <laughs> our podcast <laughs> is being streamed. It's John Dolan and Kara, they're full of empathy. <laughs> <laughs> Flip and I are going to talk about a big happy video that John Dolan just put out. Um, it's been I, a week now, isn't that's ancient history in internet it, time? Is it? What's the date of this? January twelfth. Yeah, it's almost a week. That was the uh, Wednesday, right? Yeah. Ah, time goes so fast. So he's talking about love and hate about Mormon podcasting. Because he's obviously talking about people who have criticism for him and Kara like us. I do think maybe we were mentioned a little bit, but I don't. I don't think we're at all his his biggest problems. I know he's a, he's aware of me now, but I I don't think I don't think we triggered this in any way, shape, or form. Well, also we know he's not talking about us because the way he describes his det detractors doesn't describe us or what we say at all well that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't always tell you for sure because like they could be straw manning entirely uh, what a thing oh there's oh, a, that's right <laughs> <laughs> there's one or two times where i think he's messaged me i know that he got i mean i i saw on one of the things that somebody mentioned my name to him and he acknowledged that person mentioned me he said he didn't know who i was i'm, I'm sure i sure i'm sure that's true that he doesn't for sure like know who i am i never really directed inter interact with him directly except for some backs and forth on Facebook in the manner that I could have been anybody, you know, yeah. um, like, I'm sure he doesn't remember who on earth he was talking to and that I only had back and forth with him three or four times, but they usually were things that I got his attention with because I remember I got him to talk with me back and forth about Thomas S. Monson's obituary and I got him to talk back and forth with me one time about COVID stuff and I got him to talk back and forth with me one time uh i can't remember but that's about it but i'm i'm sure he wouldn't remember exactly who i am yeah. but and why should he no nah. other than to listen to critics like you said he wanted to yeah well i i do sympathize with him a bit because he talked a lot in this about how many critics he get and i'm I, absolutely oh. sure that he gets a ton of critics and i'm absolutely sure a ton of that criticism's crappy criticism oh yeah no i mean I, that part of it i'm sure is true I, yeah. I don't doubt it that there's like yeah there's a lot of noise yeah yeah but it's not all noise no i don't I know if we're gonna get to it yeah. today but they talk so i think where the people who are really stressing them out are coming from TikTok. they mentioned some people that were former friends i have no idea who that is or if he's sub messaging somebody or if they know right who they're talking about but i'm sure that TikTok world is way more strange than than yeah i other than like the things that you send me that I see, you know, and like here and there I see little TikToks. I don't have any TikTok. I don't even twit. I don't. I've never twitted or tweeted. Um, um, I do. The, I I'll do the tweeter. Some TikTok I'll poke through, but I've never posted anything on TikTok. But I can see like that world becoming a mess real fast. And, and there's all sorts of ex Mormon, ex Mormon TikTok stuff that I bet you they just kind of started on their own, almost even kind of unawares of John Dillon. And now John Dillon's all of a sudden coming in with these, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've shown you some of his TikTok videos, right? Yeah. I've seen enough to figure it out. I think she's the one, Nuance was the one who set him up with how to do TikTok and how to start getting a following there. And, and they kind of have really precisely created four TikTok videos that they, that they make. Yeah. And there's some sort of sense that like, whenever John Dillon's doing one, he's like talking faster and talking upbeat like it's a... Yeah, it's a, well, I mean, isn't... I, I mean, I'm an old guy and I don't know anything about the future internet stuff, but it seems like TikTok is what, YouTube but 90 seconds? Yeah, it's basically kind of like a rip off of that vine stuff that used to be on because yeah, vine vine was what six seconds or something yeah, yeah. but it's but, gonna change too because they've got stuff that is where people can go live for hours too now uh, and then it's expanded from a couple seconds to a minute to three minutes and i'm sure it'll just like youtube went through that whole uh yeah thing because i remember i i still remember when the maximum youtube video was 10 minutes or something like that oh that's right and that was even a, a change from something earlier that used to be shorter than that but um, yeah, think, we are, we've been working on podcasts for about 18 and a half hours. And I know because I'm 18 and a half hours into the 24 hours of white screen I use <laughs> as my light here. 
Well, they, I'm sure, I think they do catch hell on TikTok. She talks a little bit that a bunch of it is about their appearance. And, and I, like, the appearance stuff is is stupid. Here and there, we'll tease Dylan about his appearance, but it's kind of just because he looks so Mormondy. But yeah, no, it's, like, it's, it's, it's kind not... of a compliment at the same time, too, that he looks, uh, he looks yeah. just like the. Uh... We're... John Dylan doesn't need to change anything about his appearance. It's yeah, all fine. He, he just looks like the quintessential stake president person, <laughs> yeah. and that's the type of say, person yeah. who. Yeah, like you, we you say could he just, has you could cut him. Head. Yeah, you could cut and paste him into a church <laughs> photo, and it just fits. I've always loved that term. Is the I got it from Mark Marin, but he just talks about success head. You, ha success you have this head, head like Jay Leno, <laughs> or this head like uh, um, Conan O'Brien or Guy Smiley, and yeah. it just is it's success head. You know, it's kind of funny because like you see, it's probably how they zoom or something, but. She looks like it's like a body and a head there, and it cuts to Dylan. It's always just his big old <laughs> success head right there. He's like, oh, it's a Craig Bowler Jack head too. Like, yeah. here's my great big success head. Uh, but I think those are to him about having the uh, everyday broadcaster looks that I don't think is a uh, necessarily mm -hmm. a negative thing. I wouldn't ever tease like her about her looks at all. Beyond that, I think she's perfectly pretty and all that stuff. I think she knows she yeah. is too. But uh, she gets she gets crap from people on TikTok, and if if that's the method people are going at them for, I think it's uh, I think it's I mean, stupid. Well, it's also just like some somebody called me ugly on the internet. Yeah. Like that's such a low standard of abuse. Sure, but I'm I'm sure it does come at them like sure like fire. But whatever, let's listen to them. Like if I was a Mormon Stories listener, uh. I want transparency and to help feel like the people who are producing Real the content. Like, I, I think this is kind of like part of, it's part of all their other streams too that talk about the finances and their transparency streams or something like that. And, and uh, I think they, they say transparency way too often for people who aren't <laughs> worried about what people think about their transparency. Yeah. Like truly transparent organizations don't say how transparent they are all the time. <laughs> you know, well, they, uh, th I think this is part of a series. That's part, I kind of group it together in that series where they're going over why they can make money and they even get into it in this and that stuff. But there is some sort of sense that they're, they feel some sort of existential threat from this stuff. That's, that's what it feels like. I think to anybody watching, you know, yeah. content that I listen to want to also be, be feeling seen and heard from both sides of the angle. What about this job is fun and exciting and what pushes them to keep doing it? What are the benefits of for donors that keep Kara and John to keep showing up and doing this podcast? But also as a listener, I hope people can take away what makes this job really hard and never in like a woe is me kind of way, but just in the name of like transparency and having just a more well-rounded picture of what it's like to be just a regular human trying to do a really impossible task, taking on a lot of challenging, you know. Okay. <laughs> it's impossible. I mean, it just, I mean, I know this comes up much later because this podcast is enormously long, but I remember it striking me at the time when uh, John DeLynn was going on about how like, I wish I didn't have to do this. I yeah. wish I was doing other things. I could be a millionaire in the tech sector, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, so, I mean, and I'm, I, who knows if he will ever hear this, but hey, John, uh, I'll do it for $4,000 a month and health and dental. <laughs> I'll do it because that, that's my offer because you don't want to do it and you're worth more than this. And you can't deal with all the stress and anger. You have fallback skills too. Like and he talks got about this all the time. Fallback skills, that, like, yeah. like I got nothing, and, <laughs> and I don't have a reputation to lose. So you want to save money and get out of this horrible gig that you would rather not do? I, I'll do it. The thing is, like, I, I'm qualified. I, I got, I, I, I know my Mormon history. I got a Mormon background. I know how to talk to people. I can do all that stuff. I can smile and not swear. I'll even cut my hair. <laughs> It it is all woe is me though. That's that's how I take it. It is woe is me. That's just all there is to it. Cause like I mean I don't even know. So what is four thousand dollars a month? That that's what. Uh, Twenty. What? Uh, Forty eight. Mm -hmm. I this is why I need to go into podcasting because I can't do math. <laughs> yeah. So forty eight and you know and benefits. So sixty k. Because what? So what is that? A fourth 
of what he's taking and he's underpaid okay i'll do it well he's got he's got all these credentials that mean that he's deserving of that money. oh yeah that's right because um yeah that that's what it <laughs> he had an independent board that he bought to uh well that was to, something uh, else that struck me that i know is later on is where he's like you know oh i i have all of this tech sector knowledge it's like the hell does that have to do with talking to somebody who's struggling the... because grandma doesn't want to give him birthday money anymore ever since they said they're not <laughs> going to get baptized or whatever you know <laughs> It's all just stuff, too, that if you're just selling a product and making money for the product, you don't have to sit around justifying. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> product, that's going to come up later. Yeah. A bullets flying at us a lot. Yeah. Bullets. Yeah. And what's really hard, and we'll get into this, but what's hard about, like, just the recent round of smears and attacks is, on the one hand, um, you know, when, when certain things are said or when we react in a certain way, it always elicits questions from our listeners. And we're always uh, stuck between wanting to be transparent and vulnerable, but also not wanting to reward bad actors, not wanting to... Um... There's always that thing that no, no matter what, I mean, you're going to be able to pick and choose who the bad actor is and yeah. that there's going to be some some ridiculous choices made in that. Yeah, but also, I mean, because built into all of this is none of the criticism rece we receive is valid or and we consider something we deem worthy of responding to in this episode where we talk valid, about They have taken it into account and they already know it. So. Yeah. Not wanting to make things worse, not wanting to add drama. And so it's always a finesse to find a way to, to be dignified, to be kind, to be compassionate. It's always a finesse that we are bulls in China shops in. <laughs> but also to be informative, to respond to questions and concerns, but also not to dignify things that don't deserve being dignified. It's always hard. Yeah, yeah and we're going to get into this, but... I'm sure, I'm, there's for sure stuff that doesn't deserve being dignified, but uh, I'm sure that they're also bad at deciding that. Like a certain... Uh more mormon podcast that takes place somewhere in the wee hours of the middle of the night let's just say kind of you know accused me and you of this idea that somebody might go shoot up byu one day and it's going to be because of us like that's a weird thing to say that's a but that's something that they say to them like, yeah, yeah all the time that's no, i was like... gonna say like oh kara that you were in the room every time John Larson was there and talked about the the right. Like you were there, I know, because I watched the episode. You voiced no concern. It's one of their main things is that that this this third party way of causing harm is what it, I mean. It's it's basically the essential claim of their existence. Is this third party party cause harm harm causing or whatever. <laughs> hurtful thing to say that's kind of a gross thing to say and you've done it yeah and never in a million years do i actually want to respond and dignify that with a response but that's what this episode is going to be a little bit of just explaining a very one little bit of probably there's a very so... little bit of this three hours is actually responding <laughs> to critics they're so not above the midnight mormons the midnight mormons are perfectly affable guys if you talk to them oh, they yeah. would have been affable with these guys the whole entire time and it only ever blew up into internet-y stuff because of the hatfield mccoy back and forth of, of, of what well, uh... and did you see because i mentioned this was a week ago which is ancient history it's so old that the midnight mormons aren't the midnight mormons anymore they're the, called the book of mormon show i think did you yeah, see they that? changed. Uh, they they were talking for a while about changing their title because they they wanted to yeah, not they did. call themselves Mormons or something like that. I commented. My comment was, "You guys change your name more than the church." <laughs> well, that's why they changed it. Is they, <laughs> so, have you ever seen like people like abbreviate what the new church is called? It's like T to, to judge the cold colds colds. It's like this longest abbreviation you ever seen. Like oh, even yeah. abbreviating it down. They're, they're actually. Yeah, the, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter the Consulars. Yeah. Probably a thousand things since I started working here last May, and John has tens of thousands since he started this podcast of just things that are unfortunate and icky that we have to do just to be able to continue this podcast. And if we can 
it's the world you live in not not just not just that you should expect it coming at you it's it's that old internet meme of like you're shoveling shit over a, a wall don't freak out when the shit comes back at you like that's that's all there is to <laughs> it like, yeah even if you're telling the truth or not telling the truth but no matter what like they, they just overlook that they are playing in the same the same game no, no matter what well, well and yeah, it's it. the thing we keep bringing up all the time is that these people are all of the things they complain most about the church, <laughs> which is that they, they don't like that the church is a big finger wagging moralizing operation that tells other people what's good and righteous thinking and what isn't. Yeah. And that's all the Open Stories Foundation is engaged in. And they're doing it for money. <laughs> They get so, into this whole part. So, like, part. what's different? Like, what? Yeah, what's the big difference? They get into this whole part about how we're not a cult, and they just list off all these things. And the things they list off, like, none of that like holds true, like, from the modern day church either. You know, yeah. like. Uh, but that, that's my that's the point thing I'd point to. It was like, no, I'm not saying that you're a cult. I'm saying that you're a religion. Yeah, Just like the, you know. I mean, yeah, that I, there, there there was that little sleight of hand. Where it's like, well, no, no, we're not saying you're a cult. <laughs> yeah, you're like, a religion. We're saying yeah, Just you, like their you religion, your religion. But they and, say and you I'm lack self awareness. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, cause that's our whole thing. It's like Mormons cop to it being a faith. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, whereas these guys think that they are on the side of science and logic. Yeah. I guess in my own words, just like kind of letting Mormon stories listeners in on the goods the bads the ups and downs just what this space is really truly like yeah yeah i'm gonna ask for those who are you know we're live streaming this which is an extra layer of risk and um i'm gonna ask those who are watching and commenting not to reference any of the specific instances <laughs> of drama or smearing or attack or legitimate criticism <laughs> Or we really carefully, do. politely posed questions, asking okay. for a response that you said, that, that you asked for and and promised to respond to. But anyway. <laughs> we want to be above the fray. We're going to talk more about this later. But we believe that even our worst enemies, I think, believe in some sense that, that they're doing what is right. Who are, who, who are John DeLynn's worst enemies, do you think? Kate Kelly. Well, yeah, that's that's one of the things that's I actually think is kind of one of the side. I got Rosebud. I got Rosebud is Rosebud it, is his worst enemy. Yeah. But like, yeah, who who out there is like? Because I think well, even I think the midnight some people Mormons, in the church who go after him. The midnight Mormons will zing him pretty hard and, and that stuff. But they're but, also very clearly. But I think like that's you say, they, affable guys. Like I think if you got them, this thing's like I, I'd be willing to bet that. If you if you proposed it to them that the midnight Mormons would be way happier to sit down with John DeLynn than the other way around, I'm just guessing. Yeah, I mean, from, I think that's the point that the, of yeah. like where the drama comes from is like they're talking about doing these debates or something, and that whole thing blew up because somebody Quaco liked something on Twitter, which was a meme of somebody using uh, using something from uh, Inglorious Bastards, the scene where like the the bear Jew guy beats beats somebody up. And just putting the Lynn's head and Quaco's head on it, and it's obviously oh, like yeah. a, uh, a you know, it's just a meme. I mean, they, they use those sorts of memes all the time, like wrestling memes, all that sorts of stuff. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna beat you up, and the Lynn took it and said, "This is a threat of violence. It's a threat of violence," and, and supposedly called the cops on them or, or claimed oh, wait, to call the cops right. and all this stuff. That's right. He called nine one one because somebody posted <laughs> something on the internet. And that whole entire stuff, I believe. You, you create the drama of it kind of just like Larson did with me to to get out of actually having to talk to the person because you, you oh, like yeah. it's, it's got to dangerous levels of, of stalkeriness or something like that absolutely because I mean you could very easily say like hey guy th that's a little far don't you think and yeah, and then but, and maybe deflate the tension that way but, but there's, this there's thing like is a level of... like taking it seriously just ramps it up yeah there's a level of we've all been on the internet for 20 years and we know that's just a dumb meme. Like, yeah, and also on. like, I mean, this is playground shit, mm. <laughs> you know? And th this is a 50-year-old PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, 
And the, the thing know? is, too, is like the, the, this side always like wants to act like they're above the fray and that they don't get into joking and they don't get into ripping and they don't get into riffing and they don't get into hyperbolic extreme stuff. And yes, you do. You do all the time across the board, especially in your in your threads and people like that. But you do on the actual show as well. Yeah. Like you, you, you haven't been above it at any point, which is fine. I don't think you need to be above it. I'm not above it. We're here talking crap on them, you know, but I wouldn't then say, well, now I can't talk to you because you've just been a, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd talk to you till the end of time. If, yeah. Like, and other things like, I mean, John, John Larson did smear you like mm -hmm. effectively by trying to intimate that you were some kind of dangerous unhinged. Per but yeah. It was simply that. And yet you're still willing, like, you know, if John Larson was to say, do you want to talk today? You, sure. But yeah. like, it's, it's one way he, John Larson clamped that down from his side, <laughs> you know, he, he closed the bulkhead door or whatever. I don't know what the, the, the analogy is, but it's like, well, okay. So much for listening to critics. Yeah. But I mean, I, I do understand like the level of, you got the debate me bros all over the internet who are they're trying to get some clout or trying to get attention by getting a debate from you. And my, you could put us like on that, that sort of level. Like some people built their channels off of being able to get a debate with somebody. Yeah. And I'm not the, the flip into that is like, I, I don't have some goal or dream of like building a channel. I'm just blabbing at the microphone and what happens happens. Like, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I haven't you, advertised one thing out or you have a career. Yeah. This is... In fact, it, yeah, if it blew up too big, I'd be like, oh, crap. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But there's another level of it, too, is that I already know, you and I already know that we're, we're searching for a demographic that there's tens of us. Tens of us, I tell yeah. you. <laughs> like, yeah. There's, we're not, like, the people that are, like, ex-Mormon, but, but not part well, of the new Red Guard. Even there's so few and that. far between. Like even deeper than that, I think it's it's probably getting close to two decades old, and it might as well be in another world as far as American civilization is concerned. But like way back when on the John Stewart Daily Show, <laughs> and he said something to the effect of, "You don't see anybody taken to the street carrying signs saying be reasonable." Yeah, well, you he know? had that it's whole like... rally to store reason, which I think was one of the best <laughs> things that that he ever did. Yeah, even though I don't think he's like held so strong, and especially. Some of the worst actors in our whole entire society right now are, are the gremlins that 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 boiled off of his back. Yeah, but, um, I don't. But, I, it's an uphill battle. See, this is the thing I'm realizing so much is like because I remember when I was a kid, and like like you know we we went to elementary school in the 80s, and I'm sure just like me, you there was a very clear thread talking about the Holocaust. And mm -hmm. many, many Jewish Holocaust survivors came to the school and talked to us and stuff. And I remember, like, from time to time hearing people talk about, like, like you need to guard your liberty. <laughs> you yeah. need to guard these ideas that about you can't treat anybody different on the, differently on the basis of race and ethnicity. And I was a kid, I was like, really? Come on. It's so obvious. Like, civilization is so much better without racism. Fast forward to today, where in Utah... Right now, in Utah, if my mom and my dad both get sick with COVID and go to the hospital, my mom is more likely to receive potentially life-saving monoclonal antibody treatment For because reason. she was born in a Latin American country and my dad was not. Yeah. Like, that's, like, that's my damn lifetime. I'm only 41 and I've already seen it happen. Like we're there where the idea that you should treat people differently on the basis of race, it's not, it's not just back. Like it, it's there. <laughs> it's yeah. I, I bet you it's gotten through enough to like the general society that you can already make people go. <gasps> if you just say I'm for colorblind. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it absolutely yeah. is. People just out and say, oh, so you're into racism then, you know, like they've completely Orwellified. And some, term. some random person, I, I joke that, that I'll get mom explained stuff all the time, but like they'll, they'll start explaining to me why a uh, colorblind society isn't, doesn't mean, you, you know, like just giving you the general runaround of what everybody's been inculcated into that. Like you haven't heard it before. Yeah, but, uh, and it's, it's extremely stupid because, like, you know, their, their argument comes down to, well, there are still um, uh, disparate outcomes. 
if we look at race. You know, which is just kind of the stupidest thing. It's like, Plus well, you're we, being we, a liar if you claim you, know, you don't like, see color. Like, yeah, it's not what colorblind is. <laughs> yeah, but it's also kind of like, it's kind of like saying that like, well, traffic laws need to be abolished because people still get in crashes <laughs> or people still speed. <laughs> You know, or people still use a car to after robbing a bank or to traffic, you know, drugs, you know, whatever. It's just like, you know, like just because people misuse society doesn't mean you destroy the tool. You know? <laughs> That's one of the things that comes up with the due diligence thing all the time is the, or due process is like yeah. due process, due process failed people. Why? Because they didn't get due process. <laughs> yes exactly yeah yeah that's yeah. the point you know yeah no, there's a, like for me the lesson of learning all about the age of lynching in america is like yeah yeah like we have to hold people to the process <laughs> yeah. you know the answer is due process <laughs> but anyway but we got way off on a tangent there <laughs> i figured it would I, I don't have much hopes to get too far into this but we we should do it across a couple because I know there's a few things that stood out to me, like some of them I already talked about, but maybe we'll remember them. But we might just have to like come back and just keep going at it because like there's just too much that uh, like little things and big things. Even when I was trying to edit it down, and I almost couldn't edit down anything except if it was repetitive because almost everything needed a comment well, on it. Well, uh, so here's something that just came to mind I, that I hadn't even considered until now, because like like so many things. This episode could have been bullet, bullet pointed down to about five minutes, <laughs> right? And and like and even if you just wanted like to to throw in a lot of chat and some personal comment and all that, but like if we just if we just condensed all ideas expressed, probably thirty minutes tops. They count them but out. Then they I remember, have like thirteen bullet points or something but, like that. But then I remember though. Oh, this is actually a fundraiser. So oh. this is this is basically like a PBS telethon. Because oh, I'm like, why does this have to be three hours long? <laughs> you like, made why, me realize too. Yeah, I didn't. But like, why is this three hours long, and why do they keep repeating themselves? Oh yeah, that's right. It's just yeah. like when you're trying to watch my favorite British comedies on Saturday night. You know, uh. three times a year, <laughs> they have to come in and talk and talk and talk. That's and talk so and talk true. And talk that's and talk. so true. Oh gosh. And they even like mentioned that they realize that they're going on top of uh, Radio Free Mormon and Bill Real and and. Uh, Oh gosh, we did that on an accident. Like, these guys all know each other well enough that yeah. they should have known they were stepping on other people's foot. Like, there's all sorts of people in in the podcasting world who are like, once they become a certain level of friends, they make sure to not trample on each other's times. Yeah, but you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Yeah, and even more importantly, we believe that. You think I could make that faster, or do you think it'd get too fast? Uh, give it a shot. We'll go to this 1.5. I won't go to double. Yeah. It kind of hurt people. Hurt people. Oh, and, God, um, that's the thing. Okay, well, so... They say that 500 times. Though. Yeah, so, okay, so right there, because I remember that. Critics... <laughs> he, he just lumped them all together. Who are the critics? They're hurt people. Who are the hurt people? They're the critics. So what do we need to listen to the critics for? Well, not the criticism. Yeah. Like, like he, 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 he just pathologized people that have a problem with him. That's one of their favorite sayings in all of like the ex Mormon world. They say it all the time, and I'm sure it comes from some other social justice world too, where they realize that they all turn into like a circular firing squad. Well, no, and, I mean, yeah, but it's also it's just a really cheap and sneaky way of totally dismissing the critic. Yeah. Wow. It's just because they're yeah. it's just because they're hurting and. Yeah, it's and, a, it's a total dismissal, and it's, it's and it's like a there's an insult built in, but it's covered in that. Like it's all wrapped up in that nurse ratchet smiley. <laughs> this is your medicine type. It's all way. nurse ratchet. That's like yeah. such like a good thing. Like, no, I, I mean N nurse ratchet is my all time favorite movie villain. Yeah. Because she's a nice lady who's smiling, who's following and just, the rules, and she just wants what's best for you. And that's why for me, she's the scariest villain of all villains. Mm. And so even though we're not super happy with the people that constantly smear us and attack us, um, we also want to even hold them uh, compassionately. And right. The, um... Show me some compassion, John Dillon. <laughs> There is such a different level, like because like everybody like used to complain about ex Mormon, like in ex Mormonism. You complain that somebody in the church at some point or another asked you, like, "Who hurt you? Why did you, why did you get hurt?" Yeah, yeah. And um, 
I mean, like, it's more you than once in my life. Too. Been... Like, if you talk back to, like, feminists all three years on, like, hey, I disagree with this point. Who hurt you? Did somebody hurt you? Mm. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Like, and they and they almost say it as a joke or even dismissively, you know. Yeah. Like, they made the joke, like, show me on the doll where feminism touched you. And the yeah. thing is, like, they, they say that, and it's like, and they think they're making a point. And the part where I lose friends is where I'm like, well, let me explain to you exactly how feminism played its role in systematizing sexism into the American family law system. I can show you the dates. I can show you the lobbyists, the laws, who was behind them, what ideas were behind them, where these ideas came from. I can show you, I can show exactly you on the doll. how I was harmed. <laughs> and I can feminism. show you the one place, too, that you I could ask you to change this and I'll be okay and yeah, I'll go away. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And because the thing is, like, and what you won't hear me say is that this is evidence that all of civilization is structured by women to harm people like me. I won't say <laughs> that. I won't go that far. Well, there's some sort of level, too, and it's one of my larger points with all these people is that you can't, you can't tie your profession to this and pretend to still be a 100% truth freedom fighter who doesn't have a... Uh, a uh, dog in the fight about keeping your thing going and, and i think that's something that almost everybody should realize about the past half century of real people turning activism into professions and there, we got whole school programs on how to turn activism into professions and you can look at these uh these movements and, and you can sum up the tallies of what they're making every single year and it's billions and billions of dollars but there's a level of it too that the better stuff gets the more crazy and screamy and screechy you have to get about stuff to keep the thing alive and going because you don't want to say that it's gotten better or healed or or improved well, yeah, upon absolutely or... i mean like it's a question lots of people have brought up and i've never heard an answer but like so because you know i can't remember what the figure is but it's it single digits of billions of dollars in corporate donations to blm it's huge so it's we're talking huge. about billions of dollars now so the question is what did they spend it on where is it where did it go and this isn't a gotcha because i don't know M maybe but like i don't see any thing out there it's like a corporate <laughs> it's like a yeah, welfare like, it's like a, it's reparations and but it's only paid to certain people but like, like, like i pulled up on that other dollars, video like, that there's like three something like 10 million dollars a year going to dei stuff at one university in michigan but sure, but like, so what is blm doing to advance their cause with the money because like so well, they, that lady so they abolished buying the all the Minneap houses oh, wait. <laughs> oh that's right well because so like they abolished the minneapolis police that's what they wanted but they like did they spend a billion dollars to create their their equitable police their equitable community security and hugs and cookie force or whatever the so hell that's, that's one of the things that blow my mind like both them who's the guy james uh whatever who the hands up don't shoot um, uh, came from yeah and uh, brianna taylor their families both their families are actively suing blm for never having ever once offered them anything or paid them anything yeah um, why would that yeah but um but so and then to tie this actually tie this back into what we're talking about like so wait what does where does the money go john delin so we know it mostly goes to salaries and upkeep and then you say you lose money on the parties you throw, but I'm just going to go ahead and guess. Somebody that else throws unless, those parties. Well, yeah, but also unless and until those parties start to break even or make money, they're not going to go on forever. They're not going to th thrive. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Which is like, uh, anyway. But, you know, it's, it's just the same thing, you know? It's like, okay, at least we know with John Dillon, it's like, oh, well, it mostly goes to him. And he justifies his salary later, which we've already talked about a little bit, but... In the modern days, things like that can go forever for the types of tax write-offs for super rich people, like the people who run Thrive R. And oh, yeah. They do use those things for types of tax write-offs. Like, so it's not a like real cost not, when he's saying, yeah. oh, it's a big loss, but, like, not really? No. That's, yeah, I hadn't, even, I hadn't even considered that. Because, you know, I just, I don't know. I've never had money, so I just imagine, like, oh, you, you have a lot of money, you give it away. It's tax shelters. <laughs> it's tax write-offs. Like, it's everybody's dumb except for the rich people playing these games and now <laughs> now you have all this esg money and stuff where people are, are able to kind of dump the stuff off into charity and it's all 
there is no such thing as corporate charity, man. It's all just PR. Oh. You know? No, it can't be. Hmm. It, yeah. We don't want to sort of make things worse either. So that's why we're just saying, please, in the comments, don't mention any specific names or any specific smears. We'll get to the ways the ways that people try and smear us, and we'll answer, you know, allegations <laughs> in general. Will you? Form. Will yeah. you get to that? Will you answer allegations? He'll talk about like general brief straw man ones. He says people call him rapists and stuff like that. And I don't, I haven't heard any of that. But maybe that's out there or something. Uh, I'm sure somebody's said it somewhere, but. Well, he I haven't seen is it a male. Where I've lurked around. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've just heard all men called rapists by extension, regardless of whether they've actually committed any rape or not, anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to ask people not to be calling out, even even in support of us, calling out anyone's name specifically or mentioning specific. If he, there, there is absolutely a possibility that he might, that somebody in the comments might have mentioned us if if they did do that. And, I wonder. Oh well, I mean, they did it enough. Like when he put out his most recent thing on Facebook, saying that somebody mentioned us in the comments. But I think who he and Kara are talking about here, if we're, I don't even know if we're in their mind right here. And if we are, we're way down on the list. Um, yeah. Big well, smears. I mean, and I don't know. Cause like from my end, like we, we shouldn't be far down on the list because we're not really antagonistic, <laughs> you know, at least, and, or at least we weren't antagonistic until they I would be, put us there. See, I've thought about that. And it's, I mean, it's one of the reasons we're talking about it. And I think I would be antagonistic to the point of, of uh, making, what are they worried about? They're worried about existential threats. He kind of mouths that here entirely. Like if this could be career ending stuff, career ending uh, things, well, this career ending. Um, yeah, the, the career that he wishes he didn't have to do. And there's like a level of it to me that's like, that does kind of think like the way you guys have made this, your career and your, your way of making money, that there's there's a part of me that thinks that it can't ever not be like a little bit corrupt and that's not saying i don't think people should be able to make money uh i'm just saying that like you can't be the true pure freedom fighting thing that you think that you can be and well oh that see that reminds me i know that's i believe at some point he says like i i the reason i chose the 501c3 route was to keep me honest which is no that's Backward. That's where it went. Ba that's, that's where it went down. Backward. You know? That's you know? 180 degrees backward. 100% agree. And uh, and to my point is like, are we antagonistic? Well, I mean, I'd be antagonistic enough to to the point of saying like, hey, cut out this, uh, cut out being a religion too. And and then he brings up a lot like, well, why can't the Mormon Church do it, and and we can't do it and they can do it and that's definitely like a something he's leveling at religious people who are saying yeah. that to him but us as us as people on the outside of both of them uh, i'm perfectly happy saying uh, yeah knock it off <laughs> you know well and so i guess that is the existential threat though because yeah. um if 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 you stop offering the finger wagging moralizing alternative to church and all you offer is emotional support and clinical psychology, then you should just see, just run a clinical psychology practice and advertise, you specialize in people doing faith transitions. That's how you do this honestly, John. Yeah. But I, what you have is a little church. Yeah, it's a little channel. It's a church. It's a, it's a entertainment program. Yeah. And uh, it's fine. Make your money off it. But I'd say... I would, I don't see a way I could ever, myself, if I got to that level, I could ever justify calling it a 501c3. Yeah. I think it would be a way more honest to say, hey, we're, yeah, we're just for profit and whatever money people send that we make that money. We pay he, taxes on it. He does That's later cool. on talk about his product. He says we have a product and he says we give our product away for free where it's like. Okay, no, that's you don't. 150, that's a $4,000 value if you count everybody's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now with 20% more peace of mind i also go crazy like when podcaster types say we've been giving away this product for free not when so you've been asking for money the whole time <laughs> it's like it's, it's, there's so many things that are like we've all been on the internet long enough that that, that is tired like we like yeah. saying i'm giving you this podcast for free giving me some money is just 
we know how yeah. podcasts work. We know that there's money. We know that only a certain small percentage of people actually donate to the thing. We've all been listening to this stuff forever, and we will send money to the ones that, that we like. That's we we know how it works, and yeah. no, the concept isn't that it's that it's all just for free. The concept is that you're going to get some money trickled into you for yeah. for. You know. no, I it. It's like just the PBS thing. It's like, well, you know, it helped you and you like it. You want to be cool, right? And help <laughs> other people. <laughs> oh, PBS. <laughs> that that new chart puts them right square in the middle politically. <laughs> that chart was such crap. And if you keep doing it, we'll probably ban you. Just because we're, we're trying to honestly be constructive, but also... Uh, <laughs> we will ban you so because you're trying to be honestly <laughs> constructive. You want to add to that? We will ban you. We will ban you because of our honesty. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for giving a specific already. <laughs> no, we are. We, I, don't, I know what you mean, though. I don't mind talking about smears and generalities. Yeah. Just not specific people making specific smears. Right. I'm just going to avoid that. Oh, right. I think so that's you don't. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll do our best to moderate <laughs> these comments. We do welcome comments and feedback. I also want to say one more thing. No, you don't. You don't <laughs> you know, welcome comments and feedback. They welcome positive comments. Oh, that's feedback. right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we should do is we should go on there and uh, just like light them up with with uh, compliments and see how all of a sudden we're audible. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Like, wait a minute, they can hear me? <laughs> Doing this so that people will tell us how great we are. I get so much positive feedback. I don't mean, We'll get to that, yeah. Like, like that's mean, the main part of the good parts of our job. Yeah. Like, we know that people really appreciate a lot of the stuff that we're doing, and we love the support, but it's not necessarily the reason we're doing it. Yeah, we're not doing this so that you all will tell us how amazing we are, and, and that, that's not what this is about. Okay. Do you we derive any value from that? Like, see, this is... See, there they did another sneaky thing. Like, you get value from that, John. That's worth something. Right? Maybe that's why you'd rather do this for $200,000 a year and not be in the tech center for a million dollars a year because you you get satisfaction from people complimenting you and liking you. Nothing wrong with that. There's more to this world than just what you make in dollars. That wouldn't make sense to John Larson's Marxist okay. readings of things. But... Oh, yeah. Let's just highlight a few comments okay. people telling us how much they love us. Oh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, in the comments. I don't even have time to highlight everything, but thank you, everyone, who's being so nice and supportive already. So let's get into it. Okay. All right, so the first thing we want to do, and we're going to spend a lot less time talking about the positives than what the negatives are, just because, like, we could talk forever about the positives, but we don't want to come, you know, we don't want to be only negative. So um, what we're going to do is just quickly talk about the ways that we love our job and wouldn't trade it for anything. You don't do honest, anything honest, quickly, saying, John. We didn't get more You've never done anything quickly in your life. I know that this goes <laughs> until the one hour mark. <laughs> <laughs> From this job. For Mormon podcasting, the negative, we wouldn't be doing it. But it's for me, it's a in spite of all the pain and suffering we're going to be talking about, it's absolutely uh, more positive than negative. So let's. And I think they can uh, delve into the negative all the way through when they're on the positive section. Let's start, Kara, by talking about the amazing positives. And the first one I wanted to talk about was the power of the platforms. And uh, I, I, do you want to go first on this one, or do you want me to? I'll go first a little bit, just because we we had Clinton here the other day and Natasha, and we all just had a really good chat about that was on responding to the Salt Lake Tribune mm -hmm. and talking about how the thing that people should be paying attention to if you want to write an article is how intense that is, that this little dinky office in a basement <laughs> building in Holiday, Utah, with a budget that's not that big and, you know, donors and people who believe and support this cause is able to take on, I guess you'd call it a trillion dollar organization or church. They're the grassroots fighters. Oh, that's right. It's all grassroots. <laughs> Totally I mean, that's pretty natural. much what the church is. All of their finances and everything that they're able to do, that we're able to utilize YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, and that people are supporting us and, like, caring enough about our cause that we're able to take on the Mormon church. <laughs> like, we know the Mormon church could do a lot with the platforms they have. They can't get a foothold on TikTok. I don't know if they have a foothold anywhere else, but that's... They could get a hold on TikTok if they really wanted to. Like, they... they... Yeah. The church doesn't put money into that. <laughs> they could. They don't. Yeah, I mean, the church has got a different strategy and different goals than... These guys keep talking about, like, secret money, black 501c3 money given to people to run smears on them, and I just don't think that's true at all. Like, uh, the Midnight Mormons, like, they, they have, like, uh, it's kind of on the up, up and up that they're, they, they get funded through different church stuff to do some things. This but, episode uh, has 12,000 views. Ugh. That's that's pretty small stuff. Uh, 50. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, just mean like, okay, 
So that's what? I mean, there's 12 million Mormons. 12,000 people watched this episode. How much can <laughs> Mormon stories really be on the church's radar? <laughs> I mean, I think they know it a little bit. I, I saw somebody who was at a BYU getting uh, classes from Terrell Givens on that <laughs> Latter-day Lobsters thing. And he said that Terrell Givens mentioned, yeah, if you leave the church, I want you to leave it because of Nietzsche, not because of John DeLynn. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I, like I, would agree, I would agree with that. You know, 100%. Somebody make a meme out of that for that's, me, please. That's exactly what my whole post is because, like, <laughs> why why am I picking on Delin and these guys so much? As, as a, they they think they're doing like a service to help people out, like supposedly in some loving way. Not that I think that they that they do that in the best possible way. And they get into this about people claiming people that they're ripping families apart and tearing them up and stuff like that. But my bigger issue is like. I think these guys are a portal into the Red Guard. <laughs> you know, I don't know how else to yeah. say it. It's just like they, they create activists and not all the activism is uh, positive, you know. I don't know how to land. If people are actually leaving Mormonism, it's my whole way. is like I'd rather guide them out from away from this in through somebody else like Jonathan Streeter or something like that. Like... Like yeah. something that's, that's going to really, cause these guys talk about how you're going to avoid other cults and stuff like that. But I don't, I really don't think they go to that other layer of like stopping and thinking about when you're getting whipped up into something, you know? Yeah. They're not interested in people <laughs> just leaving the church and going in their, their own way. They really want people to go their way. Yeah. And, and that's, there's going to be a growth model of that if you're uh, if your whole career is built on that and they say, boy, golly, at some point they say, boy, golly, we just love it. If this all just went away and we, no, you wouldn't, <laughs> no, yeah. you would not. No, that's a lie. Yeah. It's just a no, lie. like you could have your wish, John. Yeah. Like there's so many ways that you could have your wish. I am more than positive. If Mormons just, cause I do have friends who did just go become campers and barely pay attention to any of this sort of thing. As I frequently say it. And, um, their lives are perfectly fine and good and great. And it does happen to some ex-Mormons, but I know a lot too that go and become full-time, whatever this is, you know? And um, I, I like Roger Scruton who says, uh, his, his only definition of how he became a conservative is he saw, he was in the sixties, he saw all the people acting like riotous nutbags. And he said, well, what am I? I'm not that, whatever it is, you know? And, and that's his only definition of what he was as a conservative, you know? Um, but there, there are people who perfectly healthy leave and I'm 100% sure for really sure on my end of it, that if all Mormons, just ex Mormons just left and became that, that I really would be happy. John Lynn, I really, we, there'd be no need for any of this sorts of stuff. The, Flip and I can cover interesting things about church history well enough on our own. Yeah. You know, we don't need your podcast for it, but, and, and we can give people non medical <laughs> clinical <laughs> unlicensed advice about yeah. how to deal with their families and i really would be happy that all those people just went and started being happy and good and fine the problem yeah. i think and the only reason i'm speaking out is because i think all sorts of them go out and become very 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 liable to become useful idiots like like i think uh the win is yeah super invigorating to me to know that we get to do that so yeah. what do you have to say on that one? yeah totally like I love the David and Goliath vibe. Like I was raised on David and Goliath stories <laughs> of like right. Aaron fighting all the Lamanites, you know, that kind of thing. And I just love the idea of the fact that, uh, let's just say our budget's half a million dollars a year. That's kind of what the OSF Foundation's budget has been for a few years now. And, uh, or you take the Salt Lake Tribune or some sort of dialogue or the Mormon History Association, whatever, take any longstanding institution in this space, including the Mormon church itself, with just a few years and a half a million dollar budget annually we're literally able to make significant waves in it. Like you said, a trillion dollar organization and that has its downside. And we'll talk about that. Uh, terrible. There's so many problems with that analogy. Cause for one thing, like David didn't lead a 15 year campaign against Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> he, he threw one rock well-placed and then what and happened? Ended it. What happened to the guy? What did the guy become later in life? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's where I got. There's a chapter two to that story. Yeah. <laughs> that and the things we hate. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, if you live by the sword, in some sense, you die by the sword. But it's so amazing. I, every day I pinch myself and, and say, you know, an episode we do can lead to immediate change in a 
corporation that spent almost two centuries ignoring any feedback and squelching and silencing and punishing anyone who dared speak out. You know? <laughs> the world started yesterday. <laughs> yeah. That's, a, that's what so much my problem of, of everybody in the current modern era is, is like, there, there's nobody who didn't come through some sort of, we, we all got abused into existence, you know? <laughs> like, like we're, we're, everybody's waking up out of it and then we're stumbling right back into it, you know, as we're waking up, in, you know, into stuff. There's there's not there's not an option to have come through some sort like I talked with the Midnight Mormons a bit about like some of the evolutionary proofs that different professors have even kind of pointed to of how religions are adaptive rather yeah. than uh, parasitic and I think there's there's enough of a level to that not to say like oh boy those religions were kind of helpful for us to get to this stage of society I think beyond that I think there's almost no way we could have gotten here without going through that step. So no matter what, we all have to some at some point or another come out of reconciling that we're coming through that. Yeah. There's not there's not a person in in the world or in any part of history who hasn't because the way our species had to band together had weirdness yeah. to it to try to well, stay alive. I mean there's the limits of our intellect. <laughs> no matter what, we have to make a bunch of assumptions about a bunch of things we don't know. And, and it worked. Yeah. It worked well enough to get us alive enough to this point or, you know, wealthy enough to this point to sit, sit down and become philosophers and navel gaze about it. And and uh, th there's some sort of level of it that to me says you got to just say, hey, yeah, we all we all got well, I hate to say it that way, but we, we all were raped into reality. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, yeah. we we all got forced into this through something that that was just figuring out the best possible way through up to this point and to like yeah. sit and be angry at the thing is almost kind of like sitting and being angry at the cosmos, you know? Yeah. No, like ev every, just about everything alive today is the, is ultimately the product of a murdering rapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no really other way to put, go around that. Yeah. But it's the, one of the things about like the, the Mormons are so bad at, at homosexuality and whatever. I, I think about all of them, like, wasn't everybody in our lifetime, wasn't there pretty much universal not goodness with that sort of thing from, from all the different religions? So if you want to say Mormons are particularly bad at it, like, I always take bird's eye view of stuff. Like, we, we zoom out 200 years and, and you're an actual real historian looking back at the stuff. Are you going to pinpoint out Mormons as, as particularly bad at, yeah. at when when we woke up like, out of out of fear of homosexuality? I mean, like, you know? if if I could pose the question to like the Johns, Dylan and Larson, like, it and get a serious answer: Was Mormonism worse to African Americans than the Southern Baptist Convention <laughs> in in over two hundred years? You know, like, what, are Mormons more racist than Catholics in their 2,000 years of history? Yeah. You know, like, really? Are Mormons the, they're, like, if you want to go look for the bad I, racist institution. I don't think any rapes ever happened with the Native American. Not until Columbus <laughs> arrived. Yeah. I, I heard that from a, uh, he said, from, from a, um, yeah. an intellectual. No, that's thing. Yeah, no. Columbus sneezed on his hand. He made sure that he was carrying a lot of viruses, and he shook <laughs> hands with Montezuma, and he said, "Let me show you about how to have sex with whatever you want, anytime." Yeah, it's kind of dumb, though. I mean, it, I mean, maybe even religions talked about this all along. Is that there's no there's no way for us to not wake up and realize our nakedness. You know what I mean? And yeah. and. I, I guess Nietzsche talked about it a ton too. It's just that no matter what, as we become more aware and have more time, we can't help but stop and think about how bad we were and how terrible we were. And it is the ever present, continual religious condition. You know? Absolutely. Internet's the game changer. And now, literally, whether it's Sam Young doing what he did or Kate Kelly doing, Kate Kelly doing what she did or Mormon Stories or Jeremy Runnels, like some dude or some woman, some housewife in their basement can make a difference that has ripple effects for millions of people. And if you look at the impact of the Mormon church on the world with all its power and money, some of the things we do influences millions of people. And it's, 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 it's beautiful and it's rewarding and I'm really grateful. Yeah, and to that same point, it, it's weird and- 
I, I want to go into it more, and I've mentioned it to you and all that sorts of these sorts of things. But I do. I don't believe that there's. They've had zero effect, but I no. believe they overstate their effect. Oh, absolutely. But then also because they just talked about oh the church with all its money and power, and like this is another one of those, and it's not really a fair question, but it's also the kind of thing that they should be considering so they don't get asked these kinds of unfair questions. But like, okay, John, what if we gave you a hundred billion dollars? Yeah. You, well, you say you say that the church has a hundred billion dollars and they're holding out on saving the world with all of their money and power. So if and, you had the hundred billion dollars, how how what's your plan to save the world? What should the church be doing with that money specifically, John DeLynn, since you know better? And this is my I want to talk more about it and even kind of flesh it out better, but I have a freakonomics point about that. And my point is that money is causing them to change more than you are ever going to cause them to change <laughs> DeLynn. That money is their poison it's the ring that they have to hold on to. And the more they hold on to it, the more they have to change to stay a part of that liberal e technocratic S yeah, ESG scores. Yeah. And even the ESG scores, even before ESG scores, just being part of the liberal technocratic money-making super wealthy elite society, they've had to dance for them to keep in on those funds and, the, and those money-making things and those accreditations way more than they've had to tap dance for Delin's astroturfed, you know, or Kate program. Kelly's, yeah. you know, disingenuous stunt. And even some sort of level that if Kate Kelly did it or Delin did it and it got out there enough, I, I would venture to say it's because people from those same money ventures made it happen. You know, um, the money, the, the money from above them is going to change them and has yeah. changed them way more than this ever will. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I don't know. it's always been like that. Like, a lot of people pointed out that it was when D Notre Dame said they won't play BYU, and that, that was the straw that gro broke the camel's back on Black Sun the Priesthood. Like, I think there really is something to that, where it's like, okay, if it's going to cost us not just our, you know, public image, but we, we can't participate in the big money cherry that is uh, college football, yeah, they, they yeah. freak out that they have these hundreds of billions of dollars. I guarantee you, when they're when they are major investors in BlackRock and all these sorts of things, the main people pushing for ESG stuff, and they they can absolutely do types of stuff to to push people out of stocks based around these new types of things that they've yeah. that they've created, and the church has to do all sorts of things to tap dance to show that they're eligible to be in that elite group, and and they have ways of pushing them out and so i think when you go and see things like people have seen recently like the church bringing in kind of at byu some um some thinkers who are who are doing the um what is it the uh, liberation theology or uh -oh. um you have a you you also have um them putting out newsletters and in their newsletters them talking about microaggressions or talking about DEI stuff. I promise that that stuff's not just because they're kind of delving into it or some, some grassroots person's pushing yeah. them into it. I promise they're getting some sort of pressure from the top to say, hey, uh, you might want to show that you're doing this type of messaging if you want to stay in good graces with the, yeah. with the, with the old boys club, which is really weird. It's weird how the old boys club picked up on that as a but I mean it was a it was a Hegelian process to use a John Dillon term a Hegelian <laughs> a Hegelian dialectic as John Dillon understands it Hegelian. hard for people to understand maybe the wider structure of the way that churches change and function over time it's through agitation it's through outside pressure from the bottom up and the outside in and you know who's an expert on how structures like religions change it's Kara <laughs> Kara the stand-up comic <laughs> She knows. She yeah. understands the structures of structures. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and see, like, I don't know, like, and this is where I feel like, well, I don't want to just be a giant dickhead that just rags on these people all the time. But it's like, for hell's sake, listen to yourself, Kara. You don't understand. What do you know about how religions change? You know, like. <sighs> well, if they're playing the 4D chess, that, that's what they got to say to get the uh, donations that they're asking for. Oh, yeah, for, that's you know? right. So maybe they know and they just, they're just uh, doing the advertisement. So 
but she doesn't. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know. What do I know about how churches change? I'm just guessing that I know more than her just from my nature of just being a nerd and reading about all kinds of weird <laughs> crap all the time. And then, and I would say that, like, I, if somebody asked me, like, well, how do churches change? I'd be like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I could tell you some stories about things, but I mean, or like, if, is your goal to change a church? Also, because like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it run into the problems like, well, wait a mean, what do you mean? Change the church? Ch change it how? Change it to what? Replace it with what? Like, that was, that was my immediate problem with Kate Kelly. I was like, I was immediately suspicious of her because it's like, wait a second. You know, what, what do you, what do you really want out of this? And it's like, and we know now she just, she wanted power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that's how I misread it at the time too, myself, yeah. but I, I'm around LDS people, Mormons, rich Mormons all the time, all sorts of them. And they keep liberalizing themselves to a point where I kind of like, will look at them and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> and and, the, and I, not to yeah. use the, the uh, term liberalize. I mean, um, Wokenized? Wokenized, but this is more kind of neoliberalized because it's like kind of like a dash of woke and like a dash of uh, still thinking that's, that it's just about being the right, proper way to be for business or something like yeah. that. And um, every time they budge, which is constantly, they budge and change a thing because they're worried about these new precepts of neoliberalism. I stop and ask them and go, oh, so, so you've been listening to the Lynn too, huh? And... <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. And if I did say that to them, they would look at me cross-eyed like, what the hell are you talking about? But they are all going liberalizing them or neoliberalizing themselves constantly. Yeah. That it doesn't want called out and the best way for systems to improve and for the church to serve the people of the Mormon church, to serve people that I love is by calling out some of the unhealthy structures and dogma to make Mormonism a healthier place to belong to. And the fact that I think that's so weird to me. Like I can't sort but, out like what they think in their head. Like yeah, they, like they what? want rid of Mormonism and they want Mormonism better at the same time. Yeah, like, where it's like I, I, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that thing where um, it's like you know when the, when the Marxist says real communism has never been tried, like Kara might as well be saying real Mormonism has never been tried. <laughs> like that's basically what she's saying there, and it's like you know and I, I love that Jordan Peterson critique of that where he's like what they're saying is. If I did it, I would do it right. Yeah. And that's what Kara, like, because, you know, and I. I, I think I think that's the ultimate point of why the Lynn got excommunicated. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head is that this whole entire thing, as we've been saying, that they're religious and they are new religion and they are new churches, yeah. that the Lynn is saying, I can do this right. I can do yeah. Mormonism right. Like, do it through me. If the Lynn thinks he'd make a better stake president than mormon stake presidents right now like i'd go I think higher they, yeah exactly um yeah i mean uh, yeah that's what they're saying yeah, that's no, what we're I don't, critiquing <laughs> no i don't put it on cult level i put it on religion level yeah there you go exactly yes also it's okay to make money kara isn't ugly um we don't believe john delin is uh guilty of whatever the rosebud you know like you say he's not guilty i agree with you not guilty like we're so we're none of the we're not smearing we're none of the things that they've responded to as much as they have so far, um, but for some reason we're still not getting heard. <laughs> yeah. I could be doing a lot of things with my time, and the fact that we do get to see ripple effects from the change, especially you, John, being in the space for so long, knowing that if you stick around long enough, you'll be able to see lives improve and dogma reform. That's incredible. There's nothing like that. So. Amen. I wonder. All right. You want to go to second? Does, has John Dolan ever said that anybody's life was worse? Like, I mean, do you think he would ever say some people sh are worse for leaving the church, and like they like they were better off staying in? Because like I I can imagine that there are people who are better off staying in the church than leaving for their own good. I can totally. Do you uh, think that John? Would I don't say see John that? Dillon, No. Do you think like if we if if we could hold him to it? Nah, I, I, yeah, I don't think. I don't think he would. I'd like to give him credit and say, well, yeah, sure. Some people should stay in church, but I don't think he would say that. I would say the general essence of my position, the entirety of my position is I imagine the 10 or 12 million Mormons and I imagine the 12,000 or 50,000 Dondolinians. There's probably more than that. I don't know. And I think if those 12 million stayed what they are now or became what he wants to make them, which would be better? And my position would be, I think it's better that they stay Mormon. 
you know? Yeah, and, a lot uh, of the time. <laughs> no, I, I would say that in all. If I could choose between that or them, I would choose that if I got the magic wand, I would choose that they stay Mormon. I, yeah. I'd maybe wish like a magical third option for them, you know what I mean? But I'm just saying if I'm given those, my, Michael Malice will always do these uh, Twitter polls where he'll say choose one between these two things and then somebody always comes into the thing and says like a third thing and he just he flips out on him like there's got to be you and he like bans him and pushes him out like you got to choose between one or the other you know and and, yeah. and uh, people just always say a third thing because like they're being clever it's it's my option is the Linites or Mormons as they are I choose Mormons as they are yeah <laughs> it's so ironic that two ex-Mormon atheist lefties are here coming to the defense of Mormonism <laughs> against John DeLynn. You know, well, I, I'll tell you what, it's it's because it's it honestly spooks me. Like, it really does. Like, oh, exactly, beyond, yeah. You know. Absolutely. Like, like I've said before, where it's like, I remember, like, I stopped listening to Mormon stories because I'm like, wait a second, this is just like church. Yep. It's just like church, only in, like, in this world, you guys are are not great or beyond not great you, you yeah. have no repentance process you have no yeah uh, i had way better bishops than yeah. mormon stories has ever been to me like <laughs> as far as giving me good advice yeah. and helping me and doing things for me and making me feel better about my condition and my situation with god or not god like and i'm like honest about that you know like i've I told it before about like when you know my state president you know, like when I told him, like, ah, I just don't want to do religion anymore. And he's like, okay. And that, you know, no pressure. Yeah. It was totally cool. Like, way better than John DeLynn. More help. Oh, just the fact that we get to talk to the coolest, interesting people. We have interviewees that come sit in this chair. That's amazing. I feel like I get the to... interviewees, right? Yeah, the interviewees, the people who get to sit in this chair and tell their stories. And it feels like I get to download someone's lifetime of good lessons and thoughts and perspectives. And I get to do that for a living. I mean, who could ask for anything better? So we have some amazing, amazing interviewees that sometimes become like my new best friends. Like, so it just, it becomes like a new family, every interviewee that comes in that we keep in contact with and catch up with, see how they're doing down the road. And yeah. I'm sure I would have deleted that part out. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't know. What do you think about the interviews? Yeah. Yeah. For me, when I think about across the years, whether it's the historians, Richard Bushman and, and Grant. Oh yeah. Palmer like this part is just kind of, just kind of felt like a lot of, a little bit of humble bragging. Where it's yeah. like, yeah, I I get to talk to neat people for a living. It's like, oh, we know John. We all envy that. Like, since, since I was a teenager, I've wanted to be Conan O'Brien. Because, like, wait a second. There's this you, you just talk to cool people all day and people throw money at you? Sounds like a dream. There's this guy named Mormon Book Reviews. And he's an evangelical. It's Stephen, I can't pronounce his last name, Pinecker or, or something like that. And he's reviewing Mormon and post-Mormon and ex-Mormon books and talking to people and interviewing people. And he's doing it from like an outside place, but like an outside place of respect. And I'd be like, he's just started and he's only been going for a while and he's gonna get some more people and he's gonna get a lot on it. And for, for my money, I, I think that's shaping, I think he's also friends and like talks back and forth with the Lynn. With the Lynn. But if they're gonna be competitors, uh, um, I would, uh, I would uh, put Mormon book reviews up above it too it's like more people that go to that for a kind of more like a really actual kind of academic way of of approaching um the interviews and the books and that stuff and faster you know yeah quinn i've got to interview all of them whether it's the activists like sam young or bill real or rfm or k kelly or Lizzie hansen park you know uh i say sam young like all the activists and then just all the family I, I might cut this out or not, but I think, so he, he frequently will like mention Kate Kelly and Lindsay Hansen Park, and I think there's like an underhand thing in that of the people he might be talking about here are Lindsay Hansen Park and Kate Kelly talking shit on him. And and he'll bring them up and mention them just like the same way that he mentioned uh, Matt Long in that other video or it came out. Mm. And you don't realize that that's the person, like it's almost kind of like a sneaky way to hide that that's the person that they're talking about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I know Lindsay Hansen has problems with the Lynn and has for a long time. There's a reason you don't see her on these programs. Yeah, they, they haven't done any collaboration for years. Yeah. Please, like just yeah, the, you, if it were normal or something like that. I mean, I, I think Lindsay will bring him in for Sunstone or whatever because of the demand and that yeah. sort of stuff. But if, if this were 
any sort of sensible world, we'd see her on here as often as you see John Larson. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You and I, the Lang family, or the Young family, or uh, you know, just all the amazing, inspiring families that we get to meet. It's it's not just a platitude; like it's a who's who of game changers in our space of influencers, and not influencers in kind of the cheap, oh, social media influencers. Like, and, and he keeps mentioning Kate Kelly, and, and it'll kind of lean out. He mentioned that. He's not completely hiding that she has a problem with him, but he doesn't come straight out with it. But Kate Kelly's very openly uh, um, anti John DeLand. Yeah. Someone like Shannon Caldwell Montez, just a, a housewife who did a master's thesis in history, who did an obscure thesis that no one had heard about. We get to be, I, to, to kind of mix the David and Goliath metaphor, I think of Mormon stories as the sling, that, you know, and, and The Rock are these people's stories. Right, yeah. And we get to be <laughs> the platform, or just, or Matt, Matt. So humble. Yeah. Also, like, you threw the story at the church, and it went splat. Nobody cared. <laughs> it was a gumball. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, was I just calling those people the gumball? The thing that's so weird is, like, he mentions, like, Richard Bushman and all that stuff, too, and they get the clout from it. I, I brought it up a couple of times, but his most recent thing where he just comes directly at Richard Bushman, and I'm telling you, he said, Richard Bushman, come have a struggle session for all the problems of the church. Like, listen to the whole podcast and try to tell me that that's not what he's saying. But then he'll still use it as, like, an advertisement for... Yeah. For... Uh, the, you know, the, the Elder Holland... Matt Easton. Matt Easton. Like, we get to be the sling that launches the rock at, at Goliath. And when I say Goliath, it's not the Mormon church, per se. It's not the corporation of the president. It's injustice. It's lack of informed consent. It's pain. It's suffering. It's bigotry. Like, I don't look at us as attacking the Mormon church. I don't look at us as trying to take the Mormon church. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't look, we are the sling that brings down the Goliath that is Mormonism. I don't see us as attacking the church. Also, we are the sling. So what you are paying for when you donate to us <laughs> is a sling. <laughs> Like, just oh, this is all like... violence. This is violence. This is internet violence, and this could create. This could create. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna inspire people look to at throw us. rocks at churches. It's being for ju social justice, for kindness, for compassion, for truth, for evidence, for informed consent, for families, for mental health, and when we talk about us being the slingshot, everybody else is against that. Yeah, they're for it. See. There's the Thrive Operation. They're the people who believe in, like, you know, being happy outside of Mormonism. And then there's everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> there's one of the things, like, because uh, Marty, who I had on, she explained to me the Thrive stuff. And I just want to say, too, that, like, I don't view Delinites as, or people who do this stuff as a monolith either. There's obviously good oh, people who, who are in the Delin. Um, but, um, she talked about Thrive and the whole idea with Thrive, the way they think keep going is like Delin started noticing that they couldn't create something that would make people come together all together like the way a religion does. But they thought maybe if we brought them together, they'd form off into different pods and that those pods would uh, would uh, keep th thriving or something like that. And um, I don't know, in my view, one of the things that I've noticed from from the very first of ex-Mormon world, you just kind of get the sense of it. I think when you and I went to that very first University of Utah thing with uh, Lars and all that stuff, like I real quickly kind of started sensing and noticing that like, oh, hey, cliques are here. Just like yeah. they're, they're always here. They're never not present. And there's cliques just like there's cliques and wards. And, and uh, yeah, there's going to be cliques are part of the human experience, you know, but uh, yeah. um, that was one of the first things. And, and it's, it seems to me like the description of this is like, hey, uh, Let's just do clicks and call it that we did that on purpose, you know, but. Uh. Shot that launches the stories, which are the rocks against David Goliath. That's kind of what I mean. And it's these people that we get to interview and their stories. But I do think that there's something about that in religion that, that that's one of the things atheists can't recreate is that thing of having to try to force and create and figure out community with people who you otherwise would not. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that's the thing is like, because you saw John Larson really, really tried hard. I mean, and I say this with respect, he really worked hard to try to create a meaningful community to to replace the community people lost for Mormonism, which like, I think it's it's an admiral enough goal. But like, I, I just don't think it's possible. It's yeah, like you just can't like, there's, 
you can't have the we don't it's the no golf club like yeah. it's the club that we get together well what binds you we don't play golf okay but what binds you we all don't play golf that's not that's and not I'll, an ethos I'll, i don't know what the word is like i'll put it on the other end of it too of that if you create if you created something that did have whatever could make people feel the need to forcibly continue yeah. and, and be there you then recreate yeah. the problems no you matter just what it that, is. that's called church yeah that's and that's beyond a religion church, right there. just like i said beyond church like the the things that people point out at the boy scout organization or at the catholic church or at the mormon church is saying look inside of it you've had these bad things happen if you create an organization that gels itself well enough together across 100 years you're going to have those uh sneaky things that are swept under the carpet or or, yeah. or you don't want mentioned because it happens at a certain percentage level that you can't stop yeah that are just like having a devastating impact on evil yeah. <laughs> as i see it yeah i mean matt Easton is a good example of that Somebody devastating impact on dirty. evil <laughs> like really john you're so humble it's, it's you versus Secular. evil by humble, you meant secular. Oh, you're so yes. secular. <laughs> you're fighting evil. <laughs> Humbly fighting evil secularly. Send me money. I could be make, I could be a millionaire at Microsoft. <laughs> well, you know, commencement address. And I could charge three hundred, four hundred dollars an hour for for a person. And I don't even want to be activity. here. I would <laughs> rather not. It's just, but it's all absurd. But if you say stuff that's bad about me, it could threaten my career. This is valedictorian of BYU. And to have, you know, somebody who has such incredible power like Elder Holland call him out so directly um, for saying that he was gay and as a valedictorian in an approved speech. And where's, where does, is Matt Easton able to speak up against that kind of, I'm going to call it like a bully, you know, but that Elder Holland could say that. And so it's not necessarily, I like that you said that it's not necessarily even the Mormon church. It's against somebody who has such power and prominence and is able to say something that is so demeaning to an entire community that is so offensive that if somebody were to say that they're gay, just that has such negative consequences. So how can we undo that bad ripple effect to give Matt Easton or whoever else a platform to say, it's okay, it's actually quite fine to be gay and give people in any kind of marginalized community some type of platform. And yeah, going back to the other point about like the power of this platform that we could do that, we have built something here that people- Kara's whole statement is marginalizing to all of the gay people I know that are opposed to all gay identitarianism and just wish everyone would leave it alone. <laughs> There's also David Archuleta who refused to come on the show and had oh. a platform, not just because he's David Archuleta. I mean, you could be David Archuleta and you could call it that, but he used the platform called Instagram and that got his message out there. Now, Matt Eastman maybe wouldn't have the platform that David Archuleta had, but as soon as Jeffrey R. Holland mentions him by name and they gave him that platform to be there at BYU, Instagram would be big enough of a platform for him to put himself out there himself. Yeah. You know? People are drawn in by the stories, whether it's Matt or anyone else who was, you know. It's like, it's like creating, like, you, you have to have the need of Mormon stories to go through. You know? Wronged in any kind of way. It doesn't really matter. But some, giving somebody a microphone that they're able to, yeah, speak out against the injustice for not just themselves, but other people in their, their community, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. And just to kind of close this point, I, when we talk about the interviewees, I think about some of these historic interviewees like Tom Phillips or Hans and Birgitta Mattson or uh, Michael Coe or Robert Rittner or, you know, Christine Jepson Clark or Sandra Tanner. Uh, just th these people's stories or Dan Grant Palmer or others. These people's stories are going to go down in history as transforming lives. And it's been the honor of my life to uh, be able to help amplify these people's stories. We'll I, I, it's just too much for me. <laughs> it's, it's just too. Oh, these these people these are going to go down in history. Like, John, that's not for you to say, <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like everybody else gets to talk about how important John Lennon was. John Lennon doesn't get to talk about how important John Lennon is, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> We'll decide, John, when you do things that change lives. <laughs> Not you, you fuck face. <laughs> uh, that was Flip making a comment that I feel I have the privilege of bringing this legendary moment upon society. 
Um, Flip Legend literally said he's a fuckface <laughs> on this podcast channel. That, uh, that this could I, change lives. <laughs> this could change lives, and I'm just I'm just honored that I got to. You help are the sling. I am Dave. I'm the you sling. Are the sling. <laughs> you're, fuck the, you're the fuckface rock. rock, and I'm the I'm the fuckface sling, <laughs> and it's legendary. Amazing. And I S send us money. <laughs> don't want to miss this super important point to ask you this though is Mormon Stories is known for these long format interviews it's not typical of other podcasts what do you think is so important about keeping Mormon Stories in this long format interview style what is it about stories that you think helps people the most through faith deconstruction or faith crisis yeah, yeah we've, we talk a lot about people don't convert to religion usually intellectually it's not a rational it's, 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 it's definitionally an irrational enterprise they, and we want to mimic that on the way out <laughs> They, it's a social and an emotional conversion, almost always, whether you're raised in it or you convert to it. It's oh, because... this is the thing that popped up. Like he rings it, and there's more of it late uh, throughout this episode. It's see, I never, I listened to it the first time, and I had a million thoughts that would have taken me like 80 listenings to get through them all. But we could go through and pick out a whole bunch of moments in this episode where they are doing commitment pattern, and they oh, don't yeah. even realize it. They're yep. doing heart cell. They're doing commitment pattern. They're doing the purple dragon missionary guidebook that I went out on my mission field with. And they don't even realize they're doing it. And they just did a little bit of that, that emotional social change. That's what Mormons do. That's what missionaries are trying to do to people. <laughs> it's exactly that. You felt things. And because a bunch of people around you helped you feel like it was a good decision to get into it. And so you, um, if people are going to find a way to see Mormonism more clearly to see it for what it is, then, uh, you know, it starts with disentangling all those social and emotional binding influences. Does you know, John Dillon see you Mormonism more clearly than Kevin Joel? Was, Kevin Joel? I was going to say exactly the same thing. Like, like <laughs> he sees Mormonism for what it is. Like, yeah. Okay. And, and he's aware that it's social and emotional bonding that he's trying to get rid of, but he's not, uh, he's not in that business. Which also, this is all very much like, um, Marxist, uh, uh consciousness, right? Yeah. Like, Better oh, create that critical yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Delin Del has, a, has a correct, true critical consciousness of what Mormonism is and all the Mormons are under the spell. Okay. You don't talk someone out of a position uh logically or with reason that they arrived at emotionally and so actually I, I have i have done that i have done exactly that i have this thing's like i just personally have talked many people out of mormonism and other christian religions and i did it entirely logically <laughs> so you're wrong john people i don't because uh, I, I don't usually put, go put down that road with people but um i have i've definitely talked people out of emotional states of being yeah through logic i mean like it takes a while it's not like something you can do in an afternoon oh, but yeah. like no like because like for me like the emotional appeal is just that an emotional appeal and that's how you sell uh crappy food dehydrators uh you know in the 90s uh, or literally everything else were those crappy i, I don't know actually i kind of wonder like it was, i remember in the 90s being confused because like he sold millions and millions of those and like I remember in my life, I have seen one Ron <laughs> yeah. Peel food ever... dehydrator that was plugged in on the counter with all, food in it. I saw we've one. All seen, uh, we've all seen the Foreman grills. And, and so Foreman why grill did, works. Why didn't we see those? This is a total aside, but you know who got, it, it wasn't a Ron Peel food dehydrator, but you know who got an actual food dehydrator yeah. and, and gave me homemade beef jerky and it was excellent. It was Dumas. Doodles. <laughs> yeah. No, he... <laughs> He said uh, he said his wife actually tried to get him a, like a vintage inbox Ron Popeil, <laughs> but like they're apparently like they're they're like collectors' items now. I bet. Oh my gosh. Wait, that's a tangent. But anyway, well, but frankly, John Dillon and Ron Popeil have a lot in common because they're both people who make careers as salesmen, but they pretend to be something else. Ron Popeil <laughs> pretended to be an inventor. When yeah. he was just a salesman, and John DeLynn pretends to be saving the world from Mormonism when he's just a salesman. <laughs> uh. Out of their position, but if people are in pain, or if if Mormonism isn't serving them, then we do want them to disentangle to be able to figure out what's them versus what the church is. And so coming at coming up, take bringing heat to Mormons with like bombast and rhetoric and monologuing 
and even facts and evidence is more often than not just going to create a, a reaction. Facts, facts a and evidence reaction. are at the end of the list. Just coming at them with like a bomb bombardment of it when they're talking about doing like 11 hour, like this is the answer to the 11 hour podcast. <laughs> the backfire effect of resistance. Stories are so pernicious, beautifully, elegantly, powerfully subversive because number one, they're interesting. Subversive. And number two, they, uh, they, they pull people's emotion. And if you really get hooked on an interesting story and then someone's able to get you to feel the pain, it leads to empathy. And empathy is the most, in my opinion, empathy is probably the most dangerous threat to Orthodox religion. Because once you feel sorry for a woman whose life was wrecked by the church, by someone who was abused by the church, by a person of color that experienced racism, by an LGBTQ person that wanted to die. <laughs> by this a list truth -teller. is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... But that, he just listed every kind of person that might have been harmed by by Mormonism. <laughs> what a jackass! <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, did you did you leave the church because of somebody's story at all? Nope. I heard zero stories. I heard zero stories and left the church. <laughs> I like I always keep saying like I stopped for I I left the church when I was excommunicated. That's that's when I ceased being Mormon. I didn't leave. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was thrown out, but I also didn't really take issue with that because, you know, the rules were the rules and I, I'm a due process guy, always was, right? And the rules are the rules. I broke the rules. I got thrown out of their church. And then it was over a period of time when I realized, like, I, I no longer believe the basic claims. That's when I stopped being Mormon. It had nothing to do with Literally yeah. anything. It had nothing to do with the bad leadership I had. It had nothing to do with the weird, messed up crap I saw on my mission. You know, had, like all of that, like all the weird history, all of that stuff was always there when I believed. You know, like, yeah. And I, I mean, I, that's one thing that I, I, I feel is a little different. Because, like, you know, when I hear so many people say, like, well, I left the church because of the gay rights thing. Where it's like, wait, that doesn't even make sense to me. You know, where it's like, wait, this political issue? Like, what was your faith ever based on before? I, I genuinely don't understand, you know? But for me, it was really just that simple. I didn't believe it anymore. Stopped being Mormon. Was never antagonistic. Never stopped like, well, screw you guys. I'm going to burn this shit down. Um, which is apparently what John DeLynn thought. It seemed, that's the other thing is, again, like, it's, it's even worse with John DeLynn. Because, like, if John DeLynn had, like, come to his faith crisis... And then just went straight down the path of I ain't Mormon no more. But he did the stay Mormon, but like John DeLynn. And then like when the church was like, no, he's like, well, yeah. And he, now he's admitted so much that that was always a bit disingenuous. And, and even like right now where he's talking about like stories are, are subversive and, you know, like, it's like, yeah, subversive. Like, oh, there we go. Yeah. It's a, uh, <sighs> I don't know, but I, I, I moved out. I didn't know any person or anybody else. Like I didn't know anyone and I didn't listen to any stories of anybody. I just, but I agreed and I, and I definitely agreed back then that it, that didn't matter that much to that many people. And I do agree that it is better to emotionally, if, if your aim is to suck people out of it, if that's your goal, yeah, using using the uh, the, yeah. but the it, that, pathos, uh, the persuasive tactic. Like, is, is another way I should better. say about how I like how I left the church, and a better way to put more succinctly what I'm trying to get across is that you you are the person who keyed me into the ex Mormon internet world about what eight years after I left Mormonism. So like mm -hmm. I, I was just out there by myself and, you know, just talking to friends before I realized there was a blogger knackle, you know, cause that was about what? Oh, oh, eight, oh, nine, oh, and 10 is I think when you were like, Hey, like you started sending me leaks. Like, did you hear about, you know? And that's when I was like, Oh, there's a whole ex Mormon internet community. I had no idea, you know? And for me, like, it was just fun. I was like, Oh, like, you know, I, and I guess it was kind of different because like, you know, I didn't have to do any of the, the like figuring out how to be not Mormon anymore because I'd been doing it for years already. But so, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of a difference there because I mean, there's a, there, you know, there is a generation of people that, you know, whether it was because of, in spite of, or um, a combination of things, John DeLynn, there's like a whole generation of, of his ex-Mormons, basically, you could say, you know, but I was 
I was 10 years before that generation. Yeah, to me, there's a level of uh, if the reason for leaving is emotion based and disgust based, and I think that yeah, you know, it. that makes sense. That's like why would John Dolan listeners leave Mormonism and then just become woke? That makes sense. It's because they're leaving for emotional reasons. Yeah. I left for explicitly not emotional reasons. I left because I just very coldly came to the conclusion that I no longer accepted faith to be a reliable epistemic. And since faith was the foundation of my Mormon re belief, I no longer believed everything that I built on that faith. And it wasn't a total rejection of everything. It was like, I didn't reject all of Mormonism. I rejected the idea that faith is reliable epistemic. That, that's the thing that I rejected that made me cease to be religious and believe in God. It's really just that. But like, like all of the ideas and stuff, I'm still totally capable of like playing with them um, elegantly. I think that's the, the Oscar Wilde quote. Um, I like how he says like, you know, that he says, I fear we have lost the ability to play. Um, yeah. Or yeah. To play elegantly with ideas. I just yeah. love that phrasing. That's, but, yeah, mean, like, that's what I love to do too. I mean. Yeah. So like, I always had that, like eat, like I stuck, you know, I never had that moment of like, I don't like church. I like, I don't like the church. Like I never liked church. I never liked going to church. But like, you know, that I always knew it was just me. Like I, I know lots of people who do like church and they obviously, you know, I'm not going to tell them they're, they're living life wrong or they don't, you know, like, yeah, how, how dare you? And by the way, every day that you go to church, you're murdering gay Mormon teens or whatever. <laughs> you and, and the, I'm not marching into them saying you should care so much about this and do yeah. this and do that and that sort of thing. But these guys kind of constantly try to make the argument that all that should be there. That well, yeah, no, but I mean, look at this list he made. It's like women, LGBTQ, brown people. <laughs> Those are the people who church hurts. Like, <laughs> how stupid is that? How astounding. Because well, first off, like, all society hurts. Yeah, like, I, mean, I, mean, I heard the news. Because like, for one thing, the, the church was basically <laughs> whites only <laughs> up until just before we were born. <laughs> <laughs> and so like and, and like and somehow in just the last 40 years they've managed to do all this damage to brown people <laughs> the world started yesterday no yeah. they're not excommunicated for telling the truth if you're able to feel empathy for those people well then all of a sudden you're willing to consider all the foundational premises premises of your beliefs and that's when you're willing to kind of let everything fall to the floor and then rebuild so stories are the most powerful what? See, way there again. of leaving what do you mean let it all to the floor and rebuild like that's the deconstruction yeah of their like, formulation of it i mean like i say like my faith fell apart like but, but that was only in my head mormonism is still there yeah <laughs> you know like the the the, the ward house didn't blink out of existence yeah. when i stopped thinking that it was something worthwhile and my my big complaint with the deconstruction crowd too is that it doesn't stop at the floor the, that acid goes through the floor yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, so like, yeah, I never had this idea. It's like, well, I'm not Mormon anymore. I guess I need to build a new worldview. Like, no, like, it, I just, I never had that experience. But maybe I, that thing's like, because, you know, obviously John DeLynn has his audience. And, and so maybe that is a whole class of, of ex-Mormons are people that really are doing this deconstruction, rebuilding, emotionally based thing that john's talking about. i mean it must be it must be these are, these must be the people who um send money who else would we, it be we got to redo church we we have a we have a church shaped hole in our hearts and we need to fill it up with a with a yeah <laughs> the church shaped hole in your heart that's a good one the book of delin or something hearts that then hearts. allows you to move minds and that is oh. the strategy that's been the strategy of mormon stories that's from heart the very cell. beginning it's not that's about me cell. it's not about john it's not about my monologues or my opinions it's just there, there's like five different strategies like in the whole thing and it always kind of comes back to that he does admit that he is trying to tear it and actively move in and tear it all down which i think is obvious and plain and, but the problem yeah. is that he'll frequently try to deny that he's doing that and yeah no there's yeah there's so definitely a lot of double it talk where it's like yeah we're like I, you know we're not trying to destroy the church we just think the church should be destroyed <laughs> and we have a strategy to and, do and, it. Yeah, we have a strategy to do it. And step plans and act on and, and, and sending us money is part <laughs> is how you support that goal. Hopefully when I... if it's okay to make the church for the church to make some money 
why isn't it okay for me to make money? <laughs> well, you're making the comparison, Don. Well, the other thing is like, okay, because like, so the church has 15 million people and um, fifth, five, you know, hundred billion dollars, and they're not doing their part. Like, so just as a matter of scale, like, okay, John, you, you're making half a million dollars a year with your organization. Again, like, go save the world. Like, I live in downtown Salt Lake City. The homeless situation is getting ridiculous. Like, you, you're mad that the church won't solve the homeless problem in Salt Lake City with their $100 billion. Well, what are you doing with your half a million dollars? The church, you know, like, and obviously it's because, you know, first off, like, you and I know this, like, it, it's, I, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I can't believe how anybody, like, gets past the age of 25 and still says <laughs> things like, if, if only, if they just spent $7 billion, they could solve world hunger today. Like, what the hell Larson, are you talking Larson about? Said oh, yeah, that yeah, Larson said stream. that. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, they could end. That's right. That's he said that. Like, oh, they could, could spend uh, that money and end, could, world, uh, hunger end world hunger for a meal. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, how how are you as old as you are and, and you have that naive of view of of poverty and hunger and starvation? It's, it's insane. Yeah, but, but that's because yeah, and that's the there's point. some sort of level too that like what I'm saying is like he's putting himself on that church plane if he's comparing himself to how the yeah. church makes money i don't when i make money i don't compare it to how the church makes money <laughs> like i don't stop and say hey the church can make money too so yeah. i can get this paycheck like i don't need to make that justification <laughs> yeah no it really is that when i'm at my best when we're at our best when you're at your best kara right we're he's gonna be good at evaluating that <laughs> shining lights on people's stories letting them be what is where, what is the lynn at his best I, I was just thinking about that. Like, I mean, because one thing I have to say that, like, I, I credit the guy for is that he's really even. You know, he's he's very much John DeLynn all the time. He doesn't really, well, you know. Well, for that one podcast where he got belligerent about the, but that was, that really was one time out of Which the, one was that? Was that a recent the one? one that, the one that he didn't, he took down and then he redid oh, it the next day. And, see, I never even listened to the whole thing. I only listened to the first little bit before yeah, I. he steamed up and started crying and was yelling oh. and stuff. But that's why wow. I brought it up in that one that I was talking about because he he claimed that like the reason he could tell Brett Kavanaugh was guilty was because he got belligerent, and I was pointing out, well, look at this, Delin. When you felt like you were getting unfairly accused, you got belligerent. Yeah, you know, it's a perfect but, uh, Kafka trap. He, he of all people should know better than to say that kind of stupid thing. But but he is on the average. Like I agree with you, he is on the average pretty even. And yeah, no, that's good. You remember that Gary Larson cartoon, the the many um, the many emotions of a golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about John Nolan. Yeah. He's always just got Horrible. that kind of turtle face. <laughs> doodle, doodle, doodle. We want authentic, and then hearts and minds. Heart We're making fun of looks again. Oh my God! Hearts you know, Kara, I it's also a, have a big a nose. I got a big nose. You and I, are, <laughs> I you and I are I the big, big nose boat. Yeah. yeah. But it's different if you're a woman. Oh, that's right. Which then change, changes minds. And it sounds like what you're saying is their empathy creates a certain level of cognitive dissonance in, like, whatever it may be, a Mormon person's heart where they know There's that... empathy, and then empathy. <laughs> empathy is the creating the space of cognitive dissonance where they have to wrestle with if somebody was harmed at the hands of somebody that maybe the uh, spirit of discernment wasn't what I thought it was. It has to nuance the edges of what you thought the church was and how it actually functions, the more stories somebody is exposed to. Yeah. Yeah, because once you really I feel, feel like I need to listen to that whole sentence person. again because there's so much. <laughs> the empathy causes cognitive dissonance because the empathy creates space for dissonance in like whatever it may be, a Mormon person's heart where they know creates that empathy and then empathy. <laughs> empathy is the creating the space of cognitive dissonance where they have to wrestle with if somebody was harmed at the hands of somebody that maybe is... empathy creates the space for cognitive dissonance. I, I've been hesitating bringing it up because like it's so stupid. But like when I was listening to the podcast myself and and going through it with you just now, like there's been several times where they talk and I can't stop my head from going <laughs> from doing the hate leads to anger, anger, <laughs> whatever it is, like anger, you know. And it ends with the dark side, and like and I want it's somebody to make, thing that yeah. yeah, it's all just yeah, it's all totally circular, like and they're doing that, and like and I yeah, I can't I keep hearing that every time. They do this. <laughs> the. Uh, Spirit of discernment wasn't what I thought it was. It has to nuance the edges of what you thought the church was and how it actually functions. The more stories somebody is exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Because once you really feel for it for a train. Once you really feel. John I, really feels. He's I, a I'm real gonna, feeler. 
I'm going to expose myself because like there's so much in the ex-Mormon world of like you, when you talk about being an ex-Mormon to have your proper bona fides you have to talk about how much you actually believed when you were back when you were in yeah I, I'd never believed in spirit of discernment like that one never got me you know? yeah uh, but I guess other people did you know? I guess so. yeah like I I think I I never, I didn't, like, I couldn't think to myself, like, I disbelieved it, but I never, I never took it seriously. Like, I, I was never like, you know what I need right now is some spiritual discernment. Or, you know what I'm going to use right now is spiritual discernment. Like, I, I was very young, and I kind of intuitively figured that, like, well, no, it's... When I was on my mission, and I was very rule following because I almost kind of, like, took it as... Following the rules is almost the main import of this whole entire scene. And towards the end of my mission, I got moved out of an area to take over basically this tiny area for some zone leaders who were lazy douche canoes and wanted me to do their area for them. And their area was picked over in the middle of Mexico City, small area, and they moved me out of like an area the size of Salt Lake City with, and I had tons of people in teaching. And the only reason they did it is because these zone leaders like complained about it. And like, I, I realized on my mission that there was there was all sorts of stuff that was just because some idiot was saying something or make, coming up with an idea and it was a bad idea. Yeah. So there's no discernment in there. And I knew my whole entire mission, I'd follow rules and I said, I just do what the president says, I just do what the president says. And that was like the one time I said, I'm going to tell them they got this wrong because they got it wrong. And I wrote them a letter and said, you got this wrong. And maybe because I'd never done anything like that before to my president or anything, but he sent me right back. He sent me back to the other area and we went back and I ended up my mission with a ton of baptisms, like right in like the last week because, because I told him that. And the whole entire thing was based around the concept that I was always skeptical that they had spirit of discernment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they don't know what they're doing or, or picking or choosing here and that they're, they're yeah. making these decisions based off of other things. But that, I mean, I've, I, I tell the story of many times in my life is that I can tell you the moment that my belief in priesthood authority evaporated and it was my mission because like my mission president like I, he passed away like I loved the guy he wasn't like he was an he was an awesome dude <laughs> he was a terrible terrible mission president and i think part of the reason was that he really believed in his power of discernment oh, and really? he would not be corrected like like your guy you know where you could say where you could just make an argument and like and i mean i i, I it would be a whole other podcast to tell the story of of how my mission president destroyed my belief in in spiritual discernment and the power of the priesthood as far as like you know priesthood authority but like yeah it was basically that where it's like you know and then also like just on my mission because one thing I think was a little bit different is because, you know, I went to Northern California and like, like I've always said, it's like, it was like going to Sandy. I think there was like, and so if, if you I saw the inside me... of the, I saw the inside of the mission office a lot. And I, you know, and I was like, for a while, I was like close to the uh, APs and, you know, like, and, you know, one day, like we were sitting around and like, cause you know, the APs were in on the transfers and like the transfers was like this black box that nobody could understand. And that's one thing that's like my mission president, again, wonderful guy total jackass every transfer period the transfer would come out and there would be just like fits of rage and anger and people are like confused and angry and all this stuff like because like what you described was like it was like one obvious mistake here and they're like every transfer was like that and so in one day like i remember the ap's were like what actually happened in the transfer and he like described it to us and we're like so like like yeah it's book ended with prayers but then it's really literally just plugging holes and just just solving warm body Which, problems. I yeah. actually knew that because my dad was at the church office building working with John DeLynn's brother <laughs> for for years and years. And I knew I knew you know, I actually worked on the floor that they did those those decisions for a little while. And I even got to like peek in the room one time and saw the the some of the um, layout that they had. And yeah. and I knew that it was just basically kind of a conveyor belt mixed with little bits of uh little bits of discerning things like maybe like a gpa or something like that like your gpa right. or something like that was going to matter um not not all the time but it was going to matter if you got sent to one of the really hard language missions right yeah and um but even then it was just kind of like pluck it out pluck it out pluck it out throw it in pluck it out throw it in pluck it out throw it in you know and uh 
if you just went and looked at me in a cold, hard panic when I put my papers in of just being completely in doubt that I was going to go to some place that I thought would uh, not be ridiculous. I mean, I think that showed right there just in my complete doubt that I didn't, you know, have this yeah. like belief in like a spirit of discernment, you know. That... When I was young, it's like, I was so terrified because like I was always terrible at school. So I had a bad GPA. And I was always terrified that, like, they were going to hold that. But, it, like, you know, and that's things like, I, I mean, I really it had did. faith where it's like, God, you know, I was like, well, God, God is God. And God knows me. And God knows that if there's ever, it, and if, if there's anybody to send to a place like Finland or Laos if or whatever. If there ever was, it was you. And, and you that's know, one of yeah. the things they don't realize. GPA doesn't correlate at all to language acquisition. Yeah, not at all. But, yeah, so, like, I literally, I went two time zones over. And like I say, it was like, it was like, I, I felt like I went on a mission to Sandy, except there were fewer Mormons and not many fewer. Like, cause where I went, there was like, as far as, as far as outside of the Mormon corridor, I don't know that there's a higher density of Mormons than in the, you know, the Northern half of the Sacramento river Valley. There's a lot of Mormons mm -hmm. out there. In fact, that's, you know, I mean, the whole joke was that like a whole bunch of them, uh, you know, the pioneers got to Salt Lake city <laughs> and there's like, nope and just kept on going right out to california because that's things like you know my first area um uh like there's a whole section of town where the streets are named after my fourth cousins you know like yeah, yeah I, i'm all related to them like uh you know my great great grandpa's um brother uh yeah he he just he just bypassed salt lake city and kept rolling right into california so yeah the point is that yeah, I went to a place that there was, um, you know, Mormonism going back already, you know, as old as there were Mormons anywhere. So that was, this is a whole other tangent. Just one thing that sucked about my mission was that there was nobody that didn't already have an opinion on Mormons. So it made tracting just utterly senseless. My, mine wasn't much different. Mexico City's picked over and it already was 20 years ago. I guess so. But that's why I wanted to go out to that other area because it was in an area that was way more rural, way less picked over. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was one thing that like um that really bothered the missionaries about my mission president is that like there were some areas that i mean and part of it was just that it was really nice places to be and so obviously yeah. everybody wanted to go there but also there were like these large areas that had a lot of work to do because you know like i mean most of my missions sucked it was what they call the the armpit of california i mean like i mean geographically it's just hot flat um farmland basically but then there was like a couple of areas that were like up in the hills that were like, you know, it was like living in a freaking Ewok village. I mean, you know, that that city, Paradise, California, that burned to the ground a few years ago. I went there. Um, I never got to serve there. But, uh, you know, that that was in my mission. And so there's, and that was a, that was one of the areas that were like, you know, the president would close it down. And like and we basically always read it as like, well, president doesn't like missionaries to have fun, which I really think was about as as much thought as he put into it, if he put any thought into it. But. The point being is like he really believed in his spiritual discernment <laughs> and and it was because of him that i stopped believing in spiritual discernment i i had areas in my mission that were the size of the salt lake community college campus you know yeah you could walk around the whole entire thing in a half hour and there'd be a ton of people right within there but man it's still because part of the problem is like you couldn't get to them because they'd be behind they'd be behind one door there'd be a thousand people but you couldn't get into that one door yeah and, and um uh, it's it's a little it's a little hard to describe why why that would happen but man those areas would would become slogs after a while and and i think there's been people in those little areas there were people before me there were people after me and there's people there today who have just that one little area although i bet you with less missionaries it's um yeah, yeah. that <laughs> we've gotten in a whole other town we should just have a whole <laughs> mission episode yeah no doubt <laughs> but, by the way i was thinking earlier and i looked it up I, john delin didn't go on a mission did he no, i looked he did. up i thought oh, he did he? To latin america somewhere i think he speaks spanish doesn't he well so because i mean i don't know i just looked it up on his um the wikipedia page on him I thought he did. It doesn't. I don't know. It says he. He was. Did you born, know that none of the first presidency served a mission right now? None of the current members. They're all still old enough that that's not crazy. Because <laughs> like my dad is not. You know, my dad is twenty years younger than those guys, 
and he he was the only one out of his three it didn't become righteous like brothers. Super, super mandate into like 80, 82 or something. Yeah, like exactly. <clears throat> there was just like a 20, 30 year window where it was super mandate, and we were right square in the middle of that. Oh, we went to Guatemala. Wait, so how come he doesn't do any? He, if he speaks Spanish, he should be doing um, Estorios Mormonos or whatever. <laughs> I've never heard him speak very much. <laughs> Dear lesbian maybe, person, maybe he really sucks. For, maybe he's embarrassed. <laughs> for someone who lost their faith, once you really feel for, he's got you know, wanted to bleach her skin as a young Native American Mormon. Once you feel that empathy, how can you sit and listen to Orthodox Mormon church messages or even read Orthodox Mormon scriptures? And just once you feel that spirit. Amazed? Once you feel that burning <laughs> in your bosom. Empathy is the spirit. You got it. Knocked out right there. Oh, yeah. We're always kind of finding a new parallel. <laughs> yeah. Feel the empathy. You feel the spirit. Feel the empathy. Once you th feel that empathy enter your heart, there's no going back. I think is the that way right, you're John? behaving right now, Elder, the empathy's left the room. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, uh, we need to make an atmosphere conducive to empathy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've hit it. <laughs> Two. The pain and suffering. Let's see if we can get to the 30 minute mark. All around. Oh boy. It's not to say that the church only causes harm, but too many Orthodox Mormons and definitely wait, the Mormon wait, church wait. leadership. It's not to say that the church only causes harm. But, that's what, what he, why, that's why, he like, says. That all roads lead to harm. No, but it's, yeah, but it's also it's like, well, wait a second. John, literally nobody is saying that except for you. Like, you are the person who is contradicting yourself, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I know. This is like one of those things where it's like, I mean, I, I don't know just popped into my mind but like when a feminist says like you know feminism is literally just the belief that uh, women are human you know it's like nobody the fact that you say that betrays that you are the critical, one critical. with the screwed up worldview <laughs> critical race theory believes that you should just study some history about yeah. what happened to the black people yeah teach history that's all appears to be callous to the suffering of marginalized groups to the pain and suffering, the real pain and suffering of marginalized groups, and it's empathy. The Mormon means, Church is callous to the suffering of groups. Rank it, and file Mormons. To, I mean, the Mormon Church is a marginalized group. Yeah. Uh, it's all a matter of scale and how you want to look at it. That's the, that's my point of like the X factor with the word harm too. Is like yeah. there's only like the Thomas Sowell thing. There's only trade offs, especially yeah. when it comes to harm. And like if like yeah, I hate to does, bring it up. Does, does John DeLynn owe any empathy to the broken-hearted Mormon par faithful Mormon parents of people who not just left the church but also turned around and said, "I'm not coming to Thanksgiving anymore unless you denounce Mormonism yeah. or whatever"? You know, like does he? I mean, and and, and that's making it an extreme case, but like because you know, I can remember like because I mentioned before that I have talked to people out of Mormonism, and more than once, you know, like. And, and it happened where like one day my friend who I'd known for many, many years and they were Mormons for many, many years. And then one day she said, like, you know, just so you know, I've, I've decided I'm not Mormon anymore. And my first words were, I'm sorry, you know, and I meant it because like, you know, because first off, it's not my goal. But like, you know, my goal was for you to understand why I ain't Mormon. That was my goal, you know, but like and now that you're on this trip, like, I'm sorry, this isn't necessarily fun. And, and you're going to be in for a bad time, you know? That's my attitude. And, like, would John DeLynn be willing to admit that and say, like, you know, I'm sorry, faithful um, brother and sister Christiansen. I'm sorry I talked to your uh, kid. He, he says that a little bit, but the, all the blame all the blame goes to the church, you know? And, well, um, yeah. Then say, I can't just stay silent and just sit while these things are being said and taught while there's so much pain going all around. And so it's the empathy that leads to cognitive dissonance, which then leads to either change of beliefs or change of behavior. <laughs> yeah, and going back to the... That's like, empathy leads to hate. <laughs> <laughs> what we were talking about earlier. There is... To change, either change in your beliefs or change in your behavior. Because all those Mormons were... Those Mormons and their behavior. And you know, like, I don't know. It, it's also just this weird attitude. I, one of my favorite... I, I wish I had recorded at the time, but one of my old buddies... He's a bus driver. He's been a bus driver for ages. And he was raised Mormon, but like he was one of those guys who checked out as a teenager just entirely independently. He just realized he was a different kind of person. And one day he was talking to me about where he's like, in my personal life, cannot stand Mormons. You know, they're they're 
they're um, uh, moralizing and they, you know, they, they don't like how I dress or act and they're no fun. They don't drink. They don't have any fun at all. And in my, you know, in my personal life, I like non-Mormons because we get to hang out and swear and watch R-rated movies and have alcohol and that. In my professional life, love Mormons. They're polite. <laughs> they say hello. They line up in single file. They sit quietly and read. The non-Mormons fight. They won't pay their fare. They yell. They play loud music, you know? <laughs> and it's just like, you know, for me, it was like this, you know, I liked it, just that little juxtaposition that it's, it's not, it's none of it's black and white. A lot of it depends on context and all this other crap. But these are all nuances for which, um, these are all inconveniences to John DeLynn's project to get people out of Mormonism. And in my personal life and in my uh, working life, I like both. Yeah. And, and uh, I can hang out with Mormons. I can hang out with Mormons all the time. But they, these guys will frequently talk things too about like the person leaving Mormonism as a hero and they leave because they have high intellect and all that sorts of stuff. And sure, <laughs> sure, whatever. But thanks for the compliment. I know plenty of Mormons and I don't give a crap what you say that, that are some super high intellect, way smart, way thoughtful, way caring, way empathetic people more than I am. I didn't graduate and beat them because I got out of Mormonism. Like yeah. I, got, I got out of Mormonism and now I have the badge that says I win. No. <laughs> like, my, my faithful Mormon aunts and uncles are still winning life over me a thousand, <laughs> thousand percent. My despite, whole... despite all my brave and empathetic uh, consciousness uh, uh, <laughs> ar ar arrival at the realization that I didn't want to be Mormon no more. Yeah, I, I, I will say I'm the black sheep of like the whole entire family, and I would say I'm the black sheep of success too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a perfectly successful guy too, but they're all just doing the real thriving thing. You know what I mean? And yeah. and all the power in the world to them. And and no, I'm not more. I'm I'm less empathetic than my father, who is <laughs> died in the wool pure. pure pure Mormon as, as, the, as it gets. I, yeah, I, I can't say that I am better, happier, more fulfilled, or have more because of not being Mormon anymore. Like, I, I couldn't say it's less, I couldn't say it's more. I ha genuinely have no frame of reference. I could make the argument to myself both ways, but the fact is that I never even thought about it in those terms. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it wasn't even ever about that, but that's I mean, I think that's kind of like one of the general differences between how how uh, you and I take stuff. And that's that's one of the concepts. I saw somebody talk about it on Twitter. They even had some term to it of like when you go banning certain types of people, you might be banning like a certain type of individual who preferences direct truths over over. You know, there, there's a sense of a not not to use discrimination the way you use it nowadays, but like that you are purposefully um, weeding out a type of thinker and, yeah. and i think you and i are type i've said i've used the word deontological before but like there's like a type of thing of like we just have to stick with what's true just because we can't freaking he like help it and then that doesn't mean we're always get it exactly right it's just that yeah. when it's there we can't we can't there's something in us that says okay i can't look away from that and that's all there is to it it's not because we're we're taking some big heroic journey of being the the you know, the saviors of, of, of hurt and marginalized people. <laughs> yeah. Like but, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, cause I don't know. It's one of those things where like, I mean, obviously the world is big and hard and terrible, but you know, these guys, you know, they're, they're specifically on a mission to save the young gays yeah. and like, and I've like, you know, I'm just me and nobody's ever asked, but I've always thought about the question. If somebody asked me like, what, what is your advice to children uh, you know, young people about sex, you know, like, I mean, like, you know, and I was thinking specifically in the terms of like, you know, uh, Stephen Novella, who runs that podcast, Skeptics Guide to the Universe, he's a doctor. Many, many years ago, you know, he said, somebody challenged him, he said, like, put in as few words as possible what all of the medical liter literature says about being healthy. And he came up with, eat a variety of foods, everything in moderation, get a little exercise, don't smoke. Right. It's like, you know, distill that. And like, and I'm just like, if I wanted to distill advice for sexuality, it would be don't be in a hurry. Don't let anybody take advantage of you. Don't take advantage of anybody else. Be safe. And like, and that's universal. And I, like, and, 
And I think that's everything people <laughs> that that's everything we should be telling kids about their sexuality, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And that's thing that I think is so creepy is that like these guys think that they have the answers, and it's it's. I, I think that's the and, and that's thing because, is like, like, the, and so do the Mormons because like the Mormons have prescriptions about um, sexuality and these guys do too. Like I think if you do have, that's the problem, epistemically or, you know, on some sort of level of causality or you know, proofs of causing harm, lessening harm, growing harm, and what level of analysis you're doing at this single yeah. individual or a societal level, it all gets totally gray. And the problem is, is imagining or thinking that you have the perfect access to know what is correct or right or going to work, or if people are looking at things from an individual level, what's going to lead to less harm or more harm or a better life, or at a larger societal level, those could be two opposite things. And you know, just to go back to like the Peterson thing that everybody gets on about, like the, uh, the enforced monogamy thing <laughs> is, you know, it's an anthropological term. People got so stupid getting up in their heads about thinking he was talking about anything like yeah. else about that. But there's just a bottom line truth to so far as we've seen it, societies that do that are going to be stronger. And yeah. there's going to be there's going to be cracked eggs to make that omelet. You know what I mean? And that's did all there's to it. Um, did you follow that whole uh, the Vosh talking about oh, monogamy yeah. thing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Indeed. But yeah, like no, because uh, the Sitch and Adam they covered it and they like they went into like quite a bit. Like and it's funny because like they're just two dudes. And there they are, like, totally schooling Vosh <laughs> on, on society. But they're, like, talking about, like, no, no, like, like monogamous society. Like, they're, like, and they, like, just, I mean, it doesn't take that much to think about. But it's like, no, no, there's, you can understand how civilization is more stable if people don't just sleep around. People get really yeah. mad if you point at it or if you say anything about it. But there, there is the concept of, like, the rat utopia, which is a possibility yeah. for something that happens that, that our society or a society or a mammal mammal society if it gets into a situation of zero predators and can just sit around and navel gaze at itself starts falling apart and it starts falling apart because we all just kind of start going our own way sexually and yeah. and there's a, some sort of biolog seeming biological equivalence to that and and uh, so i i could a hundred percent say hey at the individual level any sort of person who decides they're gay, go be gay or whatever like that. Yeah. But if we want a society that works, we should have one that sticks with the concept of, hey, we should be forming these families and making these uh, heterosexual families and all that stuff. That yeah. should be the starting point of pressure and you're allowed to break out of it. And, and I hate to, to say this. I mean, it's kind of like a lot of people figured out like in schools, like one of the best ways to run a school is to have a school uniform. And the reason you have a school uniform is so that the kids can break that rule. You know what I mean? Um, and, and it's like a developmental thing or something that helps keep the rest of the school in line. You know what I mean? And, um, there at a larger bird's eye view, societal level, there probably should be some sort of pressure for a thing like that. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah. I don't think we're going to make it to 30 minutes. <laughs> Can we make it to 25? Let's keep going. Is something that can be done about it. Because I was the type of Mormon that I started something off with the that the church is true. And anybody who's hurt within the church is just hurt by a bad apple that's just like somebody who did something malicious. But that doesn't reflect the actual so, like, teachings of Jesus Christ. Because like that's that kind of thing where it's like, really, Kara? Really? You were had that, that simple-minded about that when you were a Mormon? I don't believe that anybody was that simple-minded. Like, I think e Mormons have more nuanced views than that. I, I have to believe. I want to I wanna give Kara more credit than she's giving herself in this. Yeah. I would say that, uh, yeah, it's not that nuanced. Because I, I think people did kind of approach me when I left Mormons saying, is it because your ex-wife hurt you? And that's a bit of a deeper thing. That's saying like, because that's saying like a whole marriage, you know, it's not saying yeah. some guy was rude to you in, in Sunday school or something like that. But, yeah, it's not like saying I, I don't want to shop at the 7-Eleven anymore because the shopkeeper called me a name. Yeah. Yeah, it's not.
concepts that I know our church is founded on, and this is still a good system. But I think it takes enough stories realizing that there's a certain rottenness to the system, and it only changes through people, like you mentioned, exposing their stories, exposing how they were harmed, and that the system will only improve the more and more we share these stories. Yeah, I, I studied Gandhi. Wait, Martin they're trying to Jr. improve Mormonism? What, what, what's That's the what I'm saying. There's always a back and forth. On, <laughs> do they want to burn it down, or do they want to recreate it, or do they want to be it? Yeah. I think the real answer is that they want to be it. Like I really like that's that's the, the, that's the simple answer is that and the they want is, they no, want they to don't see want more, it to yeah. all go away. Yes, they want a growth model for what their thing is. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like when you've when you've put your well your well being and your source of income and your source of of uh, social what what is it social credit or yeah. you know based all around in this you cannot go around pretending like like you don't want like, to grow it what what if like just let's just say what if the church said revelation gay people can get married and go to the temple and be sealed they does john take, close up shop no he take credit for it first <laughs> oh that's right and then then just <laughs> double down keep going into why they're but the harmful he, way and he, he's he the does, right you don't way. think he breathes a giant sigh of relief and then goes and becomes a millionaire at microsoft He'll, he'll he'll pay some no he'll pay some like lip service to it take credit for it and then triple into why they're the wrong ones to go through for for uh, yeah whatever that or like, like yeah you're, you're you're you don't love gays hard enough you don't That'll love probably be the next enough thing. and you're still toxic and you still have a past of being toxic to it oh yeah and jfk and lbj Quite extensively in the five to ten years prior to starting Mormon stories, he's put LBJ like in the same. JFK, LBJ. What was he saying? Gandhi. I've studied Gandhi, JFK, MLK, and LBJ. <laughs> okay. And LBJ is the hero. All right. And what I learned from Martin Luther King Jr. specifically is that power never relinquishes itself voluntarily. The government would have oh. never just given women the vote. It would have never just said, "You know." Yes, they did. That's why you got to fight. That's why you got to. That's why you got to. Austria. March. That's why I can't. Gotta... I, I think it was around World War Cambodia, One or not long man. after. Austria yeah. tried to give the Austrian government unilaterally in the full sway of the patriarchy, tried to give women the vote and women protested in the street and said no, because <laughs> the implication was that they would um, be uh, subject to conscription. <laughs> but like. I mean, obviously, this is an extremely complicated thing, and, you know, the history of women voting generally and the history of women voting generally, but, like, this whole thing where he's like, you know, they're not just going to give women the right to vote. No, yeah, they will. They, they have. It's happened before. You're just wrong, John. The world started yesterday. Oh, it's time to give women the vote. Or it's time to give people, it's time to get rid of the Jim Crow laws in the South. You got to go yes. fight. You got to go break a thing. No, they, like, they... Uh, yeah. yeah, never would have happened. Like the reason that any significant change has been made in civilization is when people rose up and protested and caused pain. And who was it? Did you hear? I can't remember. Adversity to the people. Somebody did the whole yeah. thing caused about the pain, caused pain and adversity. To the I wish I could were... remember exactly who it was, but somebody did like this really great essay about how purely economic forces is what ended uh segregation on trains yeah it was that was um who was that it was uh thomas soul that might be a thomas soul actual thing. but it comes from oh, thomas actually, soul but actual yeah. justice warrior did a good clip on it and that's just one example of a lot of things like that yeah but like no no like evil yeah, economic pressures they, they wanted to stop building two of everything so they yeah because it made better economic sense and, and that thing is like yeah and it's not because they weren't racist it's just that they loved again, money more than their racism and everything's a double-edged sword because I don't think any level of the uh, corporate wokeness today is a good thing, but it's the corporate leading the way on that too because they yeah. see dollar signs in it rather than... Agitators. And, agitators get stuff done. Yeah, and, and for a long time, when, when I was first in the space, there was this yeah, narrative... Agitators get, banned on, agitators get banned on Mormon stories. Yeah. Agitators. Agitators get stuff done. Ready, ready for agitators. Yeah, That's unless it's you and I. <laughs> Scholars, well, don't don't go with the church directly. The church will double down, and the church, you know, will will put up the walls if you go with them directly. So be kind, be gentle, be loving, 
don't be confrontational, don't get the media involved, work behind the scenes, and you can affect change. And so there are a lot of like these progressive Mormon historians and scholars that were always saying, no, 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 we gotta be kind, we gotta work behind the scenes. And I, I read history for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I looked at what happened to Eugene England, Lowell Binion, T. Edgar Lyon, Juanita Brooks, Fawn Brody, the September 6th. Like I realized from my reading of history is the Mormon church was never gonna change by trying to work silently and lovingly from within. That's not how. Okay. Prophet Delin has told us exactly how to change the church. That's one. That's once again, just I don't think it's like accurate to the history of stuff. I mean, there, no, yeah, we, I mean, we this know whole that list, there like, was yeah. arguments inside of the, uh, inside of the um, general authority place. You, you know, the, the, they were arguing inside of there about yeah. these types of things. We know all the way back from the David O. McKay. Um, um, I don't know what you call it when you have like what's the the uh, whole apostleship together. Uh, just the head of the church, but they were discussing that stuff inside of there and they probably made the change from pressure inside of there And once again, they got changed from like the pressure top-down pressure from society and all that stuff yeah. And again, he's given credit to people like I won't say there was zero there But at the same time too, it's like it's misattributing the credit Yeah, mm. how power works. And yeah. so getting stories public talking openly getting the media involved and getting the grassroots to become outraged Astroturfing is not grassroots. Oh. No. And then to speak up, I knew that was going to move the needle. Just, right on. And, and lawsuits, frankly. If there's two things the church responds to, it's it's legal or financial pressure or bad public relations. Or or really massive grassroots efforts that leads to a decline. <laughs> you should add that one in at the end. There's two things and Mormon stories. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, 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 he says that the stuff that we agree with is financial pressure, or it's his lawsuits and stuff like that, that from laws that changed, that changed most of them incrementally through discussion, through yeah. jurisprudential, you know, creation of, uh, yeah. of liberal law, you know. Um, the church realizes that the way forward is through change. Yeah. yeah. In, in participation. And so that's been, a, again, a big part of the strategy for the past 16 years. I had a lot of naysayers in the progressive and scholarly Mormon communities tell me that was the wrong way to go. But I think the proof's in the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> that face. <laughs> the, the proof's right. always in the pudding if you take the, uh, if you, if you, uh, take the uh, credit for... The proof is in your bank account, John DeLynn. You know what, Flip and I have been ex-Mormons that same amount of time. Yeah. We did it. <laughs> yeah we can i can just announce that i did it you know i just did it i did we did it I, i've been next mormon for it twice as long as john delin that was us man we did it <laughs> and i we were probably john you're probably ready to move on but this is one of the most important things to me is combating dogma and the church has an authoritarian structure it's it's we try to be nuanced in a way of saying that it can help people but we can't deny that there's an authoritarian structure to the way that the church is and dogma can only thrive with secrecy and people not talking about it when the dogma needs to change. And so a lot of the things that Mormon Stories over the years has done, in my opinion, is talking about the changes, the changes to the temple, talking about what changes need to happen, what small needle movement there has been, like with the temple changes, they get the, the church benefits from people thinking things are too sacred to talk about, from uh, uh, confronting problems with church leaders, that they are above reproach. The church needed to change um, a lot of things in the temple in the 90s and with the recent changes with women and sexism in the, the temple. Church the church needed to benefit. change. There's, I, I, that's the word I was picking up on too. Like she said it more than a few times in there. What was that one? They need to. This, this church needs to change. The temple ordinances needed to change. And they need, yeah. It's from calling things sacred, from calling things secret, from saying, uh, don't talk to each other about these things. Podcasts like this, they need to get things out in the open so that not only do we know need, that by talking need. about- there, there, There's so, there's so much of the, um, the uh, moral the moral standpoint and and you stop and say justify justify what you're talking about in the same way that the uh, mormons need to justify the you need to do this or should do that you guys need to justify your needs and shoulds too yeah why do you need to do that exactly. <laughs> because nobody should take it seriously at all or even think about it be, just because you announced it or, or nobody has to, because once again, I use the word should and need there. Oh, man, when you get into the world of need and should, stuff just gets so impossible. Not that it will change, but that people can feel validated, to not feel crazy, that if you're feeling an instinct that something's not right within you, but your church, which has, like I said, an authoritarian structure to tell you what is right, that you can feel validated by somebody else's story, or me and John, or whoever else is on the podcast, that you're not crazy. Yeah, yeah and just to drive on this last point is silence is the killer. Silence is the enabler. And for literally almost two centuries, the Mormon church was able to silence uh, and, and punish and marginalize anyone who spoke out against it. 
That's such so, that's Lee so Ma, stupid. You know, to Oliver Cowdery getting excommunicated. What a stunningly stupid thing to say. Like, <laughs> there have been loud, like, really. Oh, so, uh, that that's right. Conan Doyle published that book where he uh, made the the Mormons look all. Do you know what I'm talking about? I forget what it's called. Is it the scar? Not the. What's it, it? Escapes me. It was the first Sherlock Holmes story. Do you know this? Uh, the first I think Sherlock Holmes. Story, yeah, like it. It's the whole plot is based around how um, Brigham Young and the Mormons are an evil cult that kidnaps women. Like Conan Doyle went on to have a long literary career after he started it out by smearing Brigham Young. Like it's just, I mean, it's just so like they've silenced all critics. No, they haven't. You jackass! <laughs> All right, let's get to thirty minutes. Yeah, we're gonna, gonna make it. for calling Joseph Smith on his adultery to William Law, publishing the Nauvoo Expositor to you know the Godbeites with Brigham Young to the September Six to you know B. H. Roberts. Like the Church has always been able to intimidate and silence its critics, and that changed in two thousand and five, and it's it's you know we're never going back. And so so speaking okay. up. Is, Wait, what is, happened? That in changed in two thousand. This podcast. What? Is he really? Is he... The church has always been able to silence his critics because of William Law, the guy who published the Mormon Exposure. They they put Joseph Smith in jail and mob killed him because of that. He's so stupid. That all changed in 2005. Man. I, I didn't catch that. He, he, he put... Oh yeah, that's. I mean, that's probably like the best place to end in this whole thing. Like, we, we can say that I caught it the first time too. We, we, My... we can start talking about Mormonism, BD and AD, <laughs> before Dillon, after Dillon. Uh, it all changed in 2005, man. Sandra Tanner couldn't walk down the street in this city until 2005. <laughs> okay. I I exited Mormonism from googling stuff and googling around. Uh, and I was out long out of Mormonism before I ever saw the first thing I saw by Delin was his uh, his YouTube video about why people leave the Mormon Church or something like that. I don't even remember. And, and uh, it got it went a little viral for what the time frame could be viral. And um, I remember watching it and being like, oh yeah, yeah, this guy's this guy's saying like all the reasons together in, in one video here. I'm happy somebody can you know put that together like put all the reasons on one thing because I already knew all these reasons yeah, and I already got to all these reasons and I'd already heard all these reasons for, you know, a couple years before and from, from the internet. Internet. For now. And the tables have turned and uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a beautiful day. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Oh. And, uh, and it's just so, it's so rewarding to be able to be kind of that, that microphone that lets people, lift their voices. And literally, we could have done nothing without the courage of literally. our interviewees. Because they're the ones that have to get vulnerable and tell their stories and face d the possibility of divorce from their parents disowning them from excommunication. You know, I think of like Lee and Cody Young and, and so many others that all they did was like make a couple comments on Facebook, be interviewed and tell their story and they find themselves excommunicated and cut off from their religion. So much courage in lifting your voice. Nobody will understand the sacrifice. You know what I'm thinking? You know what I was immediately in my head just now? Is I was just going like, hi on a YouTube channel. A <laughs> podcast is being streamed. It's John Dillon and Kara. They're full of empathy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a bunch of uh, hymns in the works. <laughs> Try to remember some of the other ones were. But... I've always give said Give to uh, the activist. Give, oh, give, give, oh, <laughs> give, give to the activist, or we'll say you hate the case. <laughs> what do I say? Is, uh, <laughs> ideology, I am doing it. My ideology. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get those. Or that, but that's, they, they wouldn't admit to ideology. So it's got to be something like a intersectionality. I am doing it. My intersectionality. So lifting your voice. And voice the reason high. why I am doing it is all of your genetic markers are plain to see. <laughs> Demand religious community. And, uh, but that's, that's made all the difference. So. <laughs> We're only a couple points in. I'm already feeling like, yeah, <laughs> good. 
All right, the next point's create the next point's creativity. There are only a couple I, like, points I in. We're, an artist, we're, we're, we're two and a half hours in. We're oh, an artist? 30 minutes I mean, in this field? A little bit. Outside oh, this of just one's being just able like to, to interview amazing people. Yeah, like, yeah, that's a stupid one. Yeah. Um, that's right. how far we made it. Oh, well, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> Gosh. Just another 12 hours, we'll finish this thing. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> oh, no, but like, like, cause, you know, it, like at the beginning of this, I was kind of like, ah, how interesting, how much fun. I mean, when I say how interesting, it's how much fun do I have? But like going over this again, it's like, holy shit, what? If you that's stop so and think stupid. about it and look at it, there's, <laughs> that's why I said when I was trying to delete stuff out to whittle it down, I, I, I realized that I could only like whittle down stuff they repeated because yeah. they repeat a lot of stuff because other than that almost every single thing makes you stop and go what I'm like what yeah, like, <laughs> you know? i mean i, I do want to put together the super cut of like i wish i wasn't here this is all the money thing like, you know well, all that it's stuff somewhere in this compared... next half hour that she gets into that stuff of uh yeah. i'm better than mormons the... well yeah oh that was i mean that was a different super cut that i mean I oh just... yeah you want to do a super cut of wish wasn't here and then you have another super cut of uh I'm better than you. Yeah, no, I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm, I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm just saying that I'm better. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Kara. All righty. All right. I'll We're going to call that one down. one? Yeah. Cool. Okie dokie. Two and a half hours is pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad.